I feel great because I feel post-financial crisis, we've sort of been in a la-la land. What's been winning has continued to win and win, and that's been a great environment for passive investment. Although valuations are high, they could go higher. Stocks are increasingly priced for perfection. It's very difficult to think of not owning U.S. equity risk. The momentum factor is very strong right now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Now when you get to the office on Monday and it feels like you never left on Friday, like that time <laughs> really? in between, We're gonna start with just this. like a total blur, Yes. just feel that this Monday 100%. morning. Live from New York City this morning, Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Holiday short and trading week, which is good news for many of you, I'm sure. All-time high after all-time high the S&P 500 last week. Let's go through it together. In Europe, stock 600 last week, record high. In Japan, Nikkei 225, record high. On the S&P 500, I think we had our 20th all-time high at one point last week. Lisa, again and again and again, the bullishness overwhelming on this program. Bob Michael and JP Morgan at the start of this one this hour saying what I feel good. I feel good. I think that basically sums it up right now. Everyone feels good. And Deutsche Bank did their latest fund manager survey and they basically found that everyone's in the no landing camp or a majority of people are in the no landing camp. And it's not a problem because they're not that concerned about the Fed keeping inflation a little bit hotter as they really uh, reduce rates going forward. A lot of Fed speak through the week. Today we're going to hear from the likes of Bostick, Goolsby and Governor Kirk a little bit later on on Friday when the market's closed. A few hours after you get PCE, you're going to hear from Chairman Powell. We'll be talking about that through this morning. Ed Giardini on the program a little bit later. In the FT this morning, in the Financial Times, AMH saying this, if the economy is doing well with the current level of interest rates, why lower them. That's not an argument unique to Ed Yardeni. There's a few on the FOMC who have the same thoughts. Right. And I'm looking at Bostic, who basically is signaling potentially one cut. But given what you're hearing from some economists like Ed Yardeni saying, do we really need um, easier financial conditions? You have to think, was the fact that Bostic even said one rate cut is going to happen this year, is that potentially actually more significant? The fact that he's still saying we will have one. But I think it's interesting that we're going to get PCE and then Powell speaks and the markets can't trade it. They have to wait for Monday morning. It's fewer and fewer. And that seems to be the direction of travel. Fewer and later. Bostick is another one. That's the direction of travel over the last few months or so. But Lisa, to your point, even with that, this equity market is doing better than good. And so is the bond market. And that is, I think, the question mark that I have. At what point will bonds wake up to this idea of a Fed that is accommodative for risk assets, but might let inflation run pretty hot? I'm just wondering, as Goldman Sachs on Friday, did you see this come out, came out? Their bull case is for 6,000 at that. the end of this year because they could see uh, mega caps, tech mega caps up another 15 percent. I mean, I'm just I'm looking at all of this and I'm saying to myself, at what point do people care about hotter inflation? Because that's not getting priced into the market with the exception, maybe, of gold. Apparently, this is the point where Japan starts to care about the Japanese currency. Dollar yen, 150, 136. So we're totally unchanged on the session. If you miss this and you're just waking up this morning, this from the vice finance minister for international affairs, regarded as the top currency chief over in the Japanese government. The current weakening of the yen is not in line with fundamentals. It's clearly driven by speculation. We would take appropriate action against excessive fluctuations without ruling out any options. Lisa, that's the first shot, some verbal intervention. Well, that's what I was going to say, intervention theater. Let's see if it becomes action. Because right now, we've heard this so many times. How many times has the Bank of Japan tried to jawbone a little bit of strength into the yen? At what point are they going to actually start talking about tightening rates further? If they're not, are people going to buy it? Because they've been through this before. Same thing with uh, the Chinese authorities trying to jawbone with some sort of stimulus over the weekend. Everyone's saying, OK, you've said that before many times. Where is it? First piece of breaking news this morning. Just want to bring it to you. Flagged by our team here at Bloomberg just last week on Apple. Apple, Google, Meta, probed by the EU under the new digital law. That headline just crossing. Apple, Google, Meta, probed by the EU under the new digital law last week at times for Apple was a tough week. On Thursday, down by something like 4% with the investigation coming from the DOJ. And we're well flagged by our team here at Bloomberg. This investigation 
is going to start with Europe. Right. It's going to start with Europe. And we have seen Europe already flagged, you said, from our team that this was going to be happening. But the hits keep coming, especially for Apple in particular. Of course, it was the DOJ last. I mean, Google obviously has been in the crosshairs of regulators as well. But it feels like for Apple, they cannot catch a break, especially when you're looking at what's happening in China and the fact that their sales are also slowing in China. And I say that because we have Tim Cook as well in China, and he's leaning into AI and he's leaning into potential climate, because what else can you talk with Chinese authorities given the geopolitics between Washington and Beijing? Stocks in the pre-market look like this. No drama at the moment. We're down about a quarter of 1% on Apple. On Alphabet, we're down by 0.6%. On Meta, we're down by 0.2%. Alex Webb's going to join us a little bit later on this story. Let's start with the price action. Equities on the S&P 500 looking a little something like this. We're negative by 0.2%. Yields are higher by, let's call it two basis points, 4.2237. The dollar stronger through last week. We'll pick up on that theme later on in the hour. 108.18 is where the euro is at the moment. Just a little bit firmer on the euro side of things. Lisa, that currency pair positive by 0.1%. As you mentioned, this week is going to be uh, one that's kind of light on data, except for the one day when the markets are closed, which is somewhat ironic. But we do get a lot of Fed speak. You mentioned today, uh, John, we're going to be getting uh, words from Chicago's Fed's Austin Goolsby, as well as the Fed's Raphael Bostic, Fed Governor Lisa Cook. Fed Governor Chris Waller comes on Wednesday. Friday is the big event, which is ironic, again, given that markets are closed. San Francisco Mary's Daily, as well as Fed Chair Jerome Powell, are going to be speaking. Wednesday, this to me is actually one of the most important events of the week. It's China's Xi Jinping meeting with American CEOs. This to me is notable because usually he outsources it to other people. Usually it's not Xi Jinping. Usually it's some sort of uh, subjugate. And the fact that it's not is interesting. And also on Thursday, we get U.S. jobless claims. University of Michigan consumer sentiment data. But of course, it's not that important relative to what we get on Friday, given the fact that we do get the PCE deflator as well as personal income and spending. Well, that's the big week ahead. Let's get to the next 60 minutes or so. Coming up this hour, Ben Laidler of eToro with stocks coming off their best week of the year. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy on a shrinking GOP majority. And Bloomberg's Alex Webb with the EU launching new probes into big tech. We begin with our top story, the S&P 500 coming off the best week of the year with the return of Fed speak and another read on inflation just around the corner. Ben Laidler of eToro is constructive saying this, we see a stronger 2024 performance as investors look ahead to the final inflation yards, a slowing but not recessionary US economy and coming mid-year interest rate cuts on both sides of the Atlantic. Ben Laidler, I'm pleased to say, Joins us now for more. So, Ben, you say a stronger but different rally this year versus last year. Ben, what's different about it? <laughs> Not very much so far. I think the differences are all to come. So, so far, this has been very US-led. It's been very tech-led. I think what we've just started to see, and I think this accelerates as we go through the year, is the rally broadens out and smaller, more cyclical sectors and bits of the world start to perform a lot better. And I think we've started to see that. Europe's outperforming the US. The UK, dare I say it, is outperforming the US at least over the last month. You know, not much, but I'll take it. Uh, financials, industrials, you know, outperforming, you know, so far this year. Uh, this is where I think the difference comes. And this, I think, is going to be the story for the second half of the year. Ben, can you talk to us about the pillars that hold up that theme through the second half of the year? What's driving it? Well, I think this broader rally only has two pillars. They're pretty big ones. I mean, the one so far has been this re-accelerating earnings cycle. It's has started in the U.S. It's been very tech-led. But I think from here, it spreads to the rest of the world. Europe's having an earnings recession right now. But I think as we get the rate cuts, as places like Germany stabilize, I think we could see an accelerated earnings recovery in Europe, just given how cyclical and interest rate sensitive it is. That's pillar one. Pillar two is these rate cuts. And that's what gave you the strong performance last week. Central banks globally, whether it's the Swiss National Bank being the first to cut, whether it's a one and done hike from Japan, whether it's three cuts from, uh, from the Fed, central banks are really coming back into focus. We're going to get those cuts, I think, in both Europe and the US uh, in June. And that, I think, gives you the sort of second leg here. It helps support valuations and it gets some of these depressed economies like in Europe um, going again. It sounds like you're in the no landing camp, Ben. Is that correct? Uh, I think the U.S. is going to slow a little bit from here. But, you know, this is semantics, whether it's a, um, you know, a slow slowdown or a no landing. You know, I, I, there's enough in there for earnings to reaccelerate. 
on both sides of the Atlantic and that to be the sort of first pillar of this rally. The reason why it matters a bit is just because it seems like in the past, no landing had the unwelcome consequence of potentially higher inflation. And yet now people are looking at that as something that's not really in the cards and not really a concern, even with no landing as a base case, this idea that we're not going to see some sort of material slowdown. Why is that? Why is it not a concern that we're going to see greater inflation on the other side? I think there are two real risks to this rally. One is just, you know, we can't afford the US and tech to stumble here because it's so supersized. And secondly, that to your point, we're very reliant on this immaculate disinflation continuing. And the way we've been able to square this circle so far of, you know, stronger than expected growth and, you know, inflation where we're in those sort of last hard yards is this productivity boom in the US whether it's companies being forced to use their workforce better because we have such a tight labor market or the, you know, the tech productivity paradox beginning to reverse with all the investment we're seeing from AI. But you know, we need to see that continue. That is the risk. And, and it remains a risk. I mean, productivity is a sort of slippery concept. It's very difficult to get our arms around it. But the, the fact of the matter is that productivity growth in the US is running twice long-term average levels. If that continues, we don't have a inflation problem. If it disappears, you know, we do and we'll need to reconsider. Ben, rotated away from mega cap tech is different to actively shorting mega cap tech. Can you talk to me about mega cap tech and your view on exclusively that cohort of stocks? Mega cap tech is fine. This has been a very fundamentally driven rally. Mag 7 earnings up 60 odd percent in the first quarter. In that context, these valuations of, you know, 20 to 30 times for, you know, on aggregate, I think are absolutely fine. But profits are high, margins are high, valuations are, let's call it full and fair. Um, that's not where the next big driver of performance is going to come from. It's going to come from everybody else where valuations are 30, 40 percent lower, where profit margins are dramatically lower, where earnings are still in recession. That's where you're going to get the delta to the macro base case here of a soft landing and lower rate cuts. That's where the delta comes. Tech is fine, but it's not going to lead, I think, from here. Interesting. Ben, great to catch up, sir. Ben Laidler of eToro looking for gains elsewhere after we printed new all-time highs in Europe last week. Kind of stock 600 in Japan as well on the Nikkei 225. I'm a no lander. Jim Bianco, Bianco Research, coming up a little bit later. Lisa, I still think the economy is growing, a potential or better. Inflation is sticky. Headline bottomed at 3% last summer. I don't see the reason for the Fed to cut. I think the bond market is in the same camp. He is bearish on bonds. And it seems like there are other guests of ours that might feel similar. I'm curious if Ed Yardani is going to say the same thing because he had a similar in that FT article talking about why cut. At a certain point, if there is no consequence, at what point do we get this immaculate disinflation? That even Ben Laidler with the Fed put saying mm, that is one of the big questions. I'm still reflecting on what Mohammed told us on Friday Agreed. on this program Friday morning saying this. We're going to look back on this week, last week, as the week in which central banks abandoned a point inflation target for a range. I honestly think that one of the top quotes of last week was when the Fed came out and said, over time, and let me stress, over time, we want to see inflation come down. That is tacit acceptance of inflation at a hotter pace for a longer period of time, something they didn't really do in the past. Couldn't agree more. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500, negative by something like 0.2%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahira Hackers. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. Four men have appeared in court charged with carrying out a terrorist attack at a Moscow concert venue where at least 137 people were killed. Two of the men pleaded guilty. Islamic State has claimed responsibility for Friday's attack as Russian officials continue to suggest a Ukrainian role in the massacre, a claim Kiev denies. Vice President Kamala Harris is warning Israel against a major attack on the Gaza city of Rafah, where more than a million Palestinians have sought refuge since the war against Hamas began in October. Israel says it must send troops into Rafah because it's the last remaining bastion of Hamas. Israeli intelligence estimates there are around 5,000 to 8,000 Hamas fighters and leaders in the city. 
and the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration ramping up oversight of United Airlines. Sources telling Bloomberg the FAA is considering temporary measures against the airline after a series of safety incidents. The measures could include preventing the carrier from adding new routes or barring paying customers from flying on newly delivered aircraft. The incidents include a plane in Houston veering off the runway while another aircraft lost a tire shortly after departing from San Francisco. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Up next on this program, the shrinking GOP House majority. No rearview mirror. Happy to, happy to move on. Dysfunctional place. Serious uh, problems with setting priorities. We focus on messaging bills that get us nowhere. That conversation just around the corner, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Just pulling back a touch this morning. Good morning and welcome to the program. We're down by about a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields creeping a little bit higher of three basis points. The 10-year, 422.57. Under surveillance this morning, the shrinking GOP House majority. No rear view mirror. Happy to, happy to move on. Dysfunctional place. Serious uh, problems with setting priorities. We have a, a, a very uh, uh, tragic circumstance in Ukraine. We have um, a, a spiraling debt, uh, all, all kinds of out of control problems, and we focus on messaging bills that get us nowhere. Here's the latest this morning. Two Republican congressmen announcing their departures. Ken Buck of Colorado leaving immediately and Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin departing on April 19th. This leaves the House Speaker Mike Johnson with only a one vote majority. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy writing this. If that majority goes away, Democratic leader Jeffries becomes Speaker and there's an all Democratic Washington. What happens then immediately is that Democrats do a simple majority only reconciliation bill that aims to accomplish much of the current Biden program, including higher taxes on business that would be an immediate markets negative. Terry joins us now for more. So, Terry, how close are we to some big changes in the nation's capital? Well, you've uh, you've summarized it well. Uh, of course, you quoted me, so you did. But the, uh, <laughs> the uh, bottom line is that, you know, you've got a, the incredible shrinking Republican majority. And I think what uh, markets haven't and uh, businesses haven't quite woken up yet to is that uh, what you have is if you have a Speaker Jeffries is not just a flip in the majority in the House, but you have the ability in an all Democratic Washington to uh, to run another one of these uh, reconciliation bills that uniquely needs only a simple majority to do. And, you know, Biden's going to want to uh, try to enact as much of his program as possible. And I think Democrats will, too. The, uh, the the idea of going into the election with a solid record of accomplishment, even more accomplishments, uh, will be irresistible to them. So markets need to watch out for that. The Wall Street Journal put it similar to how you put it, Terry, as well, in their editorial this morning. Honey, we shrunk the GOP majority, where's the title? And they talked about this heart attack moment or absence or flip votes, and that puts leader hockey. Keen Jeffries in charge. So I want us to just push this forward. To April 30th, we have a special election in Western New York. It's a democratically held strong position. What happens after that special election? Uh, well, then what you've got is, uh, you know, you've got a, a, a partisan split. You've got an equally split uh, Congress, and there's going to be uh, lots of interesting machinations about, uh, you know, who can uh, who can br bring up an acceptable speaker who can get at least one vote from the other side and then you'll you'll see the uh, the resuscitation of all this speculation because you know remember remember from last fall uh, everybody was reminded that it did there didn't have to be a speaker that was a member of the house so you know you'll see all that speculation about you know could so and so or such and such uh, come forward but you know that's all so a dysfunctional house even more is the bad news the good news is uh, markets don't need the House to do anything else this year. Uh, so uh, they, they, they'll probably deadlock for a while if that happens. So what happens to the current aid for Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel that is still waiting in the wings? I think, you know, uh, I'm probably non-consensus on this because consensus in Washington on this is it's not going to happen. And, you know, the, the 
things generally you can bet on them not happening and be okay. But there's a group of centrists that really want this to be done in the House, and uh, I think there's a good opportunity for them uh, when they come back in a couple of weeks uh, to push that forward. The incentive to stay with the Republican Party on this is lower than ever, particularly as they, they teeter in the balance of uh, being a majority or not. And uh, and there is, a, uh, I think, a really good chance that what ends up happening is the, the centrists continue to push forward and get a majority. Uh, you know, despite what uh, some of the House purists like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene want to have happen. Given the fact that we do have this slimmer GOP majority, does it mean that the way Speaker Johnson is bringing some of this legislation to the floor with suspension of the rules would actually make it easier for legislation like you're discussing, the supplemental? Yeah, uh, suspension is uh, is a good path, and they've used that before, as you know. Uh, they and suspension uh, requires a two thirds majority of the House to pass, and uh, so they could do that certainly. Uh, and it might be the only way they get anything done before uh, before the end of the fiscal year or the calendar year. I have to switch a little bit gears, especially given the fact that there are some questions around what the turmoil in the House is going to be really uh, meaning for the former president Donald Trump. Today, he's supposed to post a bond. This is the deadline for his $464 million fraud judgment against him in New York. And I'm just wondering how much of some of the legal stuff is noise and how much really matters and is actually going to carry through with consequences for the election other than just fundraising opportunities for Donald Trump. You know, as you all say on Bloomberg, I think the Trump travails and the, and the, the court matters are largely priced in. Uh, you know, it, it's it, it continues to inflame the base, which I, I think is no bigger than it was in 2020. Uh, those who hate Trump uh, revel in his uh, his travails, and the broad middle is reminded of the uh, the Trump show and uh, and probably made tireder of it. Uh, so there's that. Number one. Number two, the idea that uh, Trump is trying to uh, turn and his uh, daughter-in-law and the the new heads of the RNC are trying to turn the Republican uh, party machine into a Trump fundraising machine, I think will not go down well with party regulars. Uh, and it also has the collateral effect of effects of not only starving uh, a, a fundraising source for down ballot Republicans in the Senate and the House, uh, but it has the ability. It also has the ability of kind of starving the uh, uh, the grassroots uh, folks that that actually need funding in order to turn out the vote. So you know, net net, I think it's very bad for Trump. Terry, I have to say, especially with some of the dysfunction that we're talking about in the House, that's leading certain Republicans to quit. Is that really problematic for the Republican Party as uh, topped by Donald Trump, or is that kind of by design? Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's very problematic. I think the uh, the the average voter and you know and I've, t I've talked to people, uh, political people who are you know actually out in the field talking to real voters and focus groups and whatnot. Um, you know, the, the, the average voter is really tired of this stuff, and uh, and they see it as a complete distraction from the really important issues uh, that, frankly, cut against uh, the President Biden, the, the economy and border security. Uh, you know, the, the impression they're left with is a Republican Party uh, that's not ready to govern or deal with the issues that they care about, even though Republicans continue to get net positives from voters in polls on the economy. So, you know, I think it drags them down. Terry, how detached do you think the average American is right now, the independent, the moderate from U.S. politics at the moment? And where is that showing up in the polls? Oh, I think it's uh, I think they're fairly de de detached. Yeah. But the uh, I think where it shows up in the polls is uh, that there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, in independent voters, there's uh, you know kind of low favorables across the board for both candidates, and there's low voting totals for both. I mean, one thing I've been pointing out consistently, including a note to markets yesterday, is that you know you can talk about uh, Trump leading all you want, but net net Trump's in the by and large in the low 40s, and doesn't uh, which is a bad place for uh, for, for a leader to be, and uh, and he's basically topped out. You know, my impression is that Trump has topped out, but Biden's got a, a floor and, and uh, you know, with the ability to, to move up. Yeah. So net net, that's a really bad place to be for Trump. Hey, Terry, good to hear from you. Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy. We should take a moment also to congratulate the former <laughs> president, Donald Trump, for his big win at West Palm Beach Trump International Golf Club. <laughs> 
club championship trophy and the senior club championship trophy as well. Do you see that? Can you do that if you own the club? <laughs> I've got no idea. Kick it into the hole. I love how Biden congratulated him as well. We're all happy for him. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. Equities on the S&P 500, negative here by a quarter of 1%, down about a third on the Nasdaq. Closing again on Friday, actually, on the Nasdaq with another all-time high. 20 of them on the S&P 500 so far this year. The Nasdaq on a five-day winning streak coming into Monday. That's the equity picture. No drama there. Let's turn to the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. I want to talk about the range we saw on the two-year last week. 461.47 is where we are currently, up by two basis points or so. We traded in something like a 20 basis point range last week. 475 almost last Monday. 455 on Thursday. And Lisa, right now, somewhere in between. What I'm trying to get a sense of right now is how much this market is getting concerned about higher inflation for longer. That seems to be the tail risk, and yet markets are totally accepting this message that disinflation will continue despite potential rate cuts. You're not necessarily seeing it in break-even rates, but just recently you've seen it creep a little bit higher. So maybe you'll start to see people reassess just what a no-landing truly means for bonds. You know what I thought was interesting last week, just looking across assets? You had this move in bonds, two-year, ten-year, down by something like double digits. And then you had this move in foreign exchange. Let's switch up the board and take a look at the dollar. The dollar had its best week going back to the first week of 2024. Always a relative trade that just struggles elsewhere, the Swissy, the Japanese yen off the back of central bank action that maybe had uh, different effects on the currencies. The, the degree to which the U.S. is bringing forward rate cuts regardless of the data, it's being doubled down even more so in places like uh, Europe, in places like Switzerland. And it raises this question, OK, which would you rather to go to a currency where the central bank is cutting rates, maybe even aggressively, and the economy isn't that strong, or go somewhere where they're going to be cutting rates and the economy is strong. That's actually a recipe for dollar strength because it is a relative game. I was thinking a lot about this this week, and I wonder how long it can continue. The euro, 108.18. Under surveillance this morning, our top story, Fed speak, picking back up this week. Goolsby boss Dick Cook on deck today. Fed Governor Waller on Wednesday, followed by Daly and Chairman Powell on Friday. Markets, remember, closed on Friday for the Good Friday holiday, but we're still going to get personal income and spending data, plus the Fed's preferred read on inflation, the core PCE deflator. Look out for a speech a little bit later from Governor Cook on the dual mandate. Just wonder on which side of the dual mandate the most emphasis will be in that address. There was a Bloomberg story over the weekend talking about how for the first time they're saying that weakness in the labor market would actually be caused to cut. Before they hadn't said that because it was sort of balanced with inflation. It seems like the dual mandate has come more into focus, although one prong of it is getting more attention and it's a new thing. When it comes to inflation, I'm also looking at the data this week for inflation expectations, how consumers are feeling, University of Michigan. I know everyone says this is tainted with politics, but also the conference board. And we saw the prior few months there was more optimism, but in February, people pulled back. And are consumers worried about inflation reacceleration as well? The willingness and ability and a stress ability to respond to adverse shocks from the Fed. And I think you're on the right thing, Bramro. This from Chairman Powell in that news conference, an unexpected weakening in the labour market could also warrant a policy response. So we know the willingness is there. They are willing to respond to adverse shocks. Can we talk about the ability? Is inflation sticky enough, hot enough, to temper their ability to respond to adverse shocks? The sort of question of stagflation. Can they counter this because of a stagflationary wind? There were a number of analysts talking about the potential for stagflation. The market isn't pricing for that. So this really is the key question. At what point does this market gain a whiff that this inflation is sticky, even with growth softening? I mean, that is the worst case scenario for markets that are positioned for perfection. Jim Bianco, Bianco Research, worth pointing out again. Joining us a little bit later, he's got some strong thoughts on this issue. I want to turn to the latest out of Japan. The currency chief speaking out against markets and a weakening yen. The vice finance minister for international affairs saying, quote, the current weakening of the yen is not in line with fundamentals and is clearly driven by speculation. Japan intervened in 22 when the yen hit 151.95 against the dollar. Japan hiked to leave negative interest rates last week, but has since seen a weaker Japanese yen. Dollar yen getting very close to those kind of levels all over again, Lisa. And you wonder, OK, here's strike one, the shot, verbal intervention. What do they follow it up with? 
And if they don't, is the market losing patience with verbal theater? At a, I mean, I keep going back to the word theater because ultimately that's what it's been time and time again. And you can see people rejecting it again this morning. They're not buying the story that they're going to step in because the message from the Bank of Japan was essentially yield curve control in all but name will continue. And they're going to still keep things on a really easy pace. And best bet, how many hikes are we going to get this year? Sort of consensus is maybe another one maybe. or two. Maybe. From Otherwise, the BOJ. even though some people speculate that the wage price spiral in Japan is actually just beginning, it's not ending. So these are some of the sort of back and forth that have people really wondering whether they've got it under control. Dot yen, 151.30. Just the last story for you Apple, Meta, Alphabet, and Google in the EU's crosshairs. The EU opening a full blown investigation into the tech giant's compliance with the region's strict new digital laws. European Commission Executive Vice President Marguerite Vestager announcing the probe earlier this morning. We will continue to use all available tools should any gatekeeper try to circumvent or to undermine the obligations of the DMA. It's important for us to achieve the objectives of the DMA such that consumers have the benefits of open, contestable markets, a market will competition. Bloomberg's Alex Webb joins us out of London for more. Alex, let's start with the DMA, and then we can get into the specifics of the difficulties around Apple over the last week. The Digital Markets Act, what was it set out to accomplish? How was it brought into law? And what are the objectives this morning based on what you've heard? So broadly speaking, it targets what it deems gatekeepers um, in, the, in the tech ecosystem. And there are a number of criteria which determine whether something is a gatekeeper. They're kind of engineered really to target the big tech companies we know about, and we include TikTok in that. It's things like market cap, perhaps more than $75 billion, the number of uh, users they have in the European Union. All of these uh, criteria that were laid out, there were three, four of them, uh, plus eight different categories are aimed at targeting these companies. Now, essentially, it was put together because it didn't seem as though the law was keeping pace with the technological landscape, that there were certain behaviors that the European Parliament, the European Union, didn't think were uh, acceptable. And so they sort of reverse engineered the legislation in order to correct that. Now, that legislation came into act a little while ago. This is the first time we're really seeing, they've given them a little bit of time to, you know, catch up with the law. Now they're starting to wield the stick and, and, and bring them into line on issues where they suspect they may not have fully adhered to the letter of the law. So Alex, in years gone by, we've heard plenty of complaints from the Europeans about US tech. And often where we end up further down the road is maybe a fine in line with something like five minutes revenue from some of these companies. Alex, is this going to be different? Do you sense this is different this time? What we've seen in the past, you know, is big fines, right? That is not necessarily the behavioral solutions that really change a company's, as you would expect, behavior. Now, this looks as though it's really targeting the behaviors and the, the scope of those fines is potentially meaningful. It's 10% of a company's revenue and can be re repeated until they fall into line. It's different from what we've seen last week in the US where uh, the Justice Department looked at a range of things pertaining to Apple. Here, the European Commission, Margarita Vestaya, is being very targeted, it seems, on at, le at least in this first sort of parry or f first um, thrust into what they are targeting. And, it, and it's very discreet parts of those businesses, which suggest they might have thought about it a little bit more carefully. We already see Apple getting rid of the 30% commission it's imposed on de developers. What can they do to make up some of these losses um, when they're facing things like they are in the EU? Well, they've scrapped this 30%, but they haven't necessarily scrapped it entirely. They've just reduced it. And when we look at what, how much of Apple's total business that is, it isn't me you know, that meaningful. Of course, services overall have become a far larger part of Apple's uh, revenue. But a lot of that is to do with things like the amount of money they get from Google in order to make it the uh, preferred search engine. It's to do with the rise of Apple TV+. Plus. It's to do with Apple Music. It's not just uh, the App Store. Now, it, when it comes to how they then offset some of that, well, there will be a bit of a decline. The real thing, you know, as everybody can talking about, is new product categories, right? And like, that is something they have been trying, not least in services, and of course with Vision Pro. This thing in and of itself is not 
a massive slice of Apple's revenue. As John mentioned, and Alex, I think that it's important to double down on this idea that in the past we saw EU types of fines and probes into the big tech giants of the United States. Everyone just kind of shrugged and said it's going to be a rounding error. It's not going to be that substantial. How much is this time different just because, in particular for Apple, just because of everything that's happened, not just with the Department of Justice, but also given the overhang with China and some of the slowdown that we saw in sales there? Yeah, I think you kind of point at just two or three things that are really making this perhaps a little bit different. Firstly, of course, that Apple is starting to stutter a little bit when it comes to growth. It is still managing to grow its bottom line, but on, on, when it comes to revenue, it seems to be shrinking a little bit. Now, that is something that is harder to fix if you then have the second thing that I'm getting it on to, which is this broader fear that if you are constantly in the crosshairs of antitrust, uh, of regulators, then as a company, your culture it can change a little bit and you start second guessing yourself. Do we want to do this or are we going to get ourselves in trouble? I don't want to put this in email because maybe I'm going to be subpoenaed. This is the sort of thing that we saw at Microsoft 20, 25 years ago. It took them some time to recover from that. Of course, Microsoft did recover from that. They are now the biggest company in the world by market capitalization. But it did change the culture there in a way that has been well documented. That is now the big fear with Apple, whether it starts to chip away at their ability to come up with these new blockbuster products. Just to put a bow on it. Is this more of an Apple story and less of an all of the big tech story that they're being targeted right now by the EU simply because there is this feeling that they're going to be disproportionately affected with culture changes at a time where their business model is being fundamentally challenged in terms of its global presence? I think the stakes for Apple right now feel a little bit higher. That doesn't mean that the Google and Meta or Alphabet and Meta aren't going to be targeted at all. There's also, she was talking about Amazon too. The thing you do have to remember though is that the European Commission only has so much capacity. You know, they don't have hundreds of people working on this stuff. It is they're relatively small teams actually. So uh, if Apple's the one gaining the headlines right now and it's the one that she's spending the most time talking about, you could probably well expect it's where they're going to be spending a lot of their time and attention. That doesn't mean that the others won't come into the firing line at some stage a little bit further down the line. Alex, great to catch up with you, sir. I think we'll touch base a little bit later. Alex Webb on the latest story, going through what the potential fines could be. Fines of up to 10% of global revenue or up to 20% in the case of repeated breaches. They could be big numbers if it goes in that direction. They could be. And this we've heard so many times and then they haven't been. This does feel slightly different just because of some of the other pressure that Apple in particular is under. I wonder how much this has to do, though, too, with the sort of national champions or the increasing animosity between the U.S. and Europe over certain trade rules. I mean, really, if it were European companies, would they have the same approach? I do have to, to, you know, question that. Uh, two things. So the one, Apple, yes, I'm with you, is operating from a position of weakness, unlike anything we've seen for quite a few years now. Second piece of it, typically I'd sit here and say yes. This is a classic case of European envy going after US names that they don't have. And then last week yes. happened with the DOJ. Right. It's coming from all sides now. It's coming from the US too. Right. Which, I mean, again, we were wondering last week, what's the consistency here? What's the goal? I, you know, this is a confusing moment. I don't have a sense of what the motivations are on all sides. And we don't understand either the legality of some of the prosecutions or some of the charges that certainly have been opened up in the U.S. It's an interesting moment for Apple in particular, but really all the tech giants. And who the victims are, too. I mean, I like the Safari browser, don't you? I mean, I'm not sitting there on my iPhone looking for an alternative to it anyway. Really? It functions well. Chrome? And also, some things they went after felt like almost personal and petty, like the blue versus green dot. Oh, the DOJ? Yeah, when yeah. you're looking at the DOJ. One name that Alex mentioned but didn't give a ton of weight to is ByteDance. What is the EU going to do in terms of the TikTok owner? <laughs> That's going to be also, very interesting. They also come into this purview. Good point. Apple right now in the pre-market down by about 0.6%, and maybe that will prove Bramo's point, depending on what happens there. Who are they actually going after here? Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Let's get you the Bloomberg Brief. Here is Yahira Hakez. Hey, Yahira. Hi, John. President Biden signed a $1.2 trillion spending bill over the weekend, averting a partial government shutdown. The bill does not include any aid for Ukraine. The deal triggered a new attempt to remove House Speaker Mike Johnson, but former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who was removed in October, says he doesn't see the motion picking up much traction. 
Donald Trump faces a deadline today to post a bond to cover the civil fraud judgments against him. If Trump can't pony up roughly half a billion dollars, New York's attorney general could start the process of seizing the former president's assets. Trump is also set to appear in Manhattan court in a bid to dismiss charges related to his hush money case. A break fire for Mike Max Verstappen opened the door for Ferrari's Carlos Sainz to win the Australian Grand Prix, with his Ferrari teammate Charles Leclerc finishing runner-up. It was the first race back for Sainz after undergoing an emergency appendectomy two weeks ago. Ferrari's win snapping Verstappen's nine-race winning streak dating back to last season. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? I'm not sure who put that story there, but Yahara, thank you. I appreciate it. Ferrari won two. Closing the gap with Verstappen. Might get a driver's championship, Bramo. Could happen. Really? I really? think it's highly unlikely, okay, but it, you know what? It's nice that you finally start to see Red Bull failing when it's you that's been failing for a long, long time. I hear you. I want to let, just let you have this moment. Just enjoy this moment. Is this my moment? This is your moment. This, this is, is your my Ferrari moment, moment of glory. Okay. And I just, please, take it. Can I have the camera? Yeah. Forza. Thank you. <laughs> Up next on the program, the path to 2%. I think we're going to look back this week, on this week, as the week in which central banks abandoned a point inflation target for a range. Big take from Mohammed. That conversation up next. I love Ferrari fans getting overexcited. The message is coming through. Monza, September. Patience. Yeah. Let's see where we are in a couple of months' time. Equity futures on the S&P, negative here by a quarter of 1%. Yields higher by three basis points. 4.2296 on the US 10-year. Under surveillance this morning, the path to 2%. I think we're going to look back this week, on this week, as the week in which central banks abandoned a point inflation target for a range. Then we're going to look back and say this was the point when they realized, in the case of the Fed, for example, it's no longer a good idea to have a 2%, let's have 2 to 3%. This has have been a really important moment, but it's going to play out very slowly. Here's the latest this morning. The PCE deflator, the Fed's preferred measure of inflation due Friday, expected to show still elevated price pressure. Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic saying he's less confident on the inflation path than he was in December, anticipating now just one cut this year. Laurent Valbillon of Allspring writing, quote, We're about at the point where we start to see calls in the market for no cuts at all. Base case for me is still a few cautious cuts from this Federal Reserve. Laurent, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. So, Laurent, let's get straight to that quote from from Mohamed Alerian from our program on Friday. I'd love for your thoughts on this, Lauren. I think we're going to look back at this week, last week, as the week in which central banks abandoned a point inflation target for a range. How do you respond to that, Lauren? I mean, it's a big call. I know it's a big, it's a big, it's a big statement. Um, I, I can see his point, though, right? Like having just a point in time inflation target. Uh, how does that work in practice? You know, in practice, there is always a range component to it because we're looking at a certain average over time. Uh, what I thought was more interesting, actually, in his statement was that he put the range at 2 to 3 percent, not, say, 1.5 to 2.5 percent. So that idea of that sort of structurally higher inflation level embedding itself down into economies. Um, it's certainly possible. You know, we've seen a lot of stickiness in this disinflation path. Um, but I think it's also too early to call an end to that 2% mid-range of any target. Could we do some scenario analysis? Let's say he's right, and let's say that range is something like 2 to 3%. Is that bad news for bonds based on how they're priced currently? Well, no, I don't think it is. Um, if that a bit, 2 to 3% range two years ago would have been absolutely disastrous. But if you think about the path that bonds have taken over the last 18 months, two years really now, and where yields have reset to, both government bonds and, and credit, you know, there's a lot more juice in that market. I think even at 2, two to 3% inflation target, or inflation numbers, there's, there's, there's an appeal to bonds that simply wasn't there two years ago. It raises a question, though, of when the Fed 
ends its cutting cycle, not just mm -hmm. when it begins, right? And this is something that you raised, that you do still think that there is going to be at least a rate cut this year, but you think that the window for easier monetary policy closes at the end of the third quarter. What does that mean in terms of where rates will end up? Is this an underappreciated aspect of this particular cycle? Possibly. Um, you know, I certainly think out of all the, the core market central banks, obviously by Japan, the U.S. Federal Reserve looks to be the one with the least, spa the least space to cut rates and, quite frankly, the least need to, to cut rates. Um, you know, I think we'll see more out of the ECB. Uh, the Bank of England might delay a little, but I think they're going to be following the ECB before too long. Um, whereas for the Fed, you know, if you think about the journey we've taken this year alone. At the start of this year, the market was pricing in seven rate cuts, which always looked uh, a, little, a little wild. We're now back at three, which to me looks, looks optimistic. But we do run out of space, I think, at the end of Q3, as you said. Um, but that's okay. You know, if the Fed's talking about a, a June uh, start to rate cuts, which seems to be where the market is coalescing, you know, that gives them time to do a couple of 25 basis point moves and then stop and reassess. You know, there's going to be a lot of event risk as we're going into the, the latter half of this year. Um, and I think all the central banks are going to need to be aware of that. You know, it's really interesting that this, the dollar strengthened last week on the idea of mm. the Fed loosening, even though we do see stronger than expected data. How much is that just a function of the fact that all central banks are going to be doing this now? <laughs> sort of akin to what uh, Mohamed Alarian was talking about. And the U.S. is just still going to be the strongest economy. So that's the place that people are going to park their money. I think that's a, a huge part of it, absolutely. You know, we've had this grow, gr growing growth differential with the U.S. and other core markets. It's being joined by perhaps a growing inflation differential looking forward. So, that, yes, absolutely, there's room for the Fed to cut a couple of times, but still be the higher interest rate play on a global basis. It could be and a very will... different cycle, Lauren, just to jump in on foreign exchange. Mm. Typically, we'd associate a global central bank cutting cycle with global economic weakness. It doesn't feel like that this time around, but given the strength we're seeing in the United States, can you think of a parallel to look back on, to observe how the dollar performed in this kind of scenario where we've got dollar strength against the backdrop of a global rate cutting cycle and global growth isn't bad, global growth is going to be okay? Absolutely. Um, but it's all on a relative basis, right? So if rates are tight right now, we can see a couple of rates that get us to neutral. Uh, and that works, that still works well for the global economy. Um, you know, it's all that, that, that relative valuation, that, that relative basis. You know, in terms of historical parallels, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's sort of a, a late 2000s type of feel to it. But, uh, you know, history never quite repeats, although maybe that does tend to rhyme a little. Um, but I think there's, like I said, I think for me, the big point for this year is going to be that shift in, in policy from tight to neutral. Um, you know, there's not yet the evidence that it needs to go to outright accommodative. Such a good point. final last point there, Lauren. Thank you. Lauren Vilbilly on there of Allspring. The last point there, Bramo, from tight to neutral, not tight to easy. It's a big difference there. Yeah, but we don't even know what neutral is. And this has really been one of the big points that we've heard from one analyst after another. What if neutral is a whole lot higher? Ed Yardani talking about how, what's the problem? Don't fix something that isn't broken. Why cut rates if the economy seems to be chugging along? This raises the question, how do we know that it's not easing? How do we know that it's just moving to neutral when we don't even know what neutral is? What's your view on Ed Yardani's stance on equities? at the moment. Ed came into the year really, really constructive. It's like the market has moved to Ed and now Ed's maybe less comfortable with the outlook. He seems at kind of range bound. It's this whole idea of a prolonged cycle rather than just uh, sort of short and hot or long term kind of incredibly robust. He was tempering. It doesn't, see a lot, doesn't seem to have a lot of upside baked in for the remainder of this year. Again, how much is it because of some of these risks, this idea of the potential for inflation to pick back up? And bigger thoughts maybe on 2025, the year beyond the one we're in. Coming up in the next hour, Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research. We'll catch up with him on his latest piece in the Financial Times this morning. Henry de Trey's of Vader Partners. We'll be catching up with her as well. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence on the latest fines that might be just around the corner for big tech coming from the EU all over again. And Sonal Desai of Franklin Templeton. I can tell you Sonal's going to have some stronger thoughts on what Mohammed El Arian had to say on Friday and what that, let's say, tacit, tacitly accepting higher inflation at the Federal Reserve could mean for global bonds. And about what the risk premium has to be and the idea that the neutral rate 
looks more like 4% to her than 2.5%. Again, you start talking about this and gaming it out. It's a very different investing proposition. This maybe is the risk case that Ed Yardani is looking at as potentially capping some of the upside to equities and other risk assets. Ed Yardani, just moments away. Here's the state of play in financial markets. We'll start with equities on the S&P 500 futures here. Just a touch negative. We're down a quarter of 1% after seeing a series of all-time highs around the world just last week. A record high in Europe on a stock 600 in Japan. On the Nikkei 225, last week we had the 20th record high on the S&P 500. Equities this year, better than OK, and that certainly wasn't the consensus coming into 2024. Yields are a little bit higher on the session over the last week, lower. We're up by three basis points this morning. Your 10-year, 422.76. Live from New York City, the second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next. The U.S. is really exceptional when it comes to its economy. The outperformance that we've seen of the U.S. has been entirely based on solid fundamentals. Hey, I can list a whole bunch of things to be worried about, but a lot of them are not playing out. The good side of the economy and the supply side of the economy is doing a lot of the work for the Fed right now. We try to find where is the smoking gun? Where are the demons? Too hard to find. There are more signs going the other way. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. The bullishness on Friday just absolutely overwhelming. Bob Michael, JP Morgan, I feel great. I think that just about sums it up. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. I'm not sure if you feel so great on a Monday morning, but welcome to the program. <laughs> Equity futures on the S&P, negative by a quarter of 1%, coming off the back of the biggest weekly gain on the S&P 500. So far this year, we are light on economic data through the week. We climax conclude on Friday with PCE data Friday morning. So, Bramo, that's the one this week kind of builds up to. Yeah, although I think that we already found out because Jay Powell leaked it in his own press conference we said it was 0.3 percent and that was what was giving them confidence either way the fact that we get that data point on a day where we don't get trading after all of the fed speak that we get this week is going to be compelling to see whether people rethink this idea of a nirvana no landing that supports everything so why cut interest rates governor waller i think said it himself right governor waller came out in the last couple of weeks and he said what's the rush president kashkari of the minneapolis federal reserve came out and said something similar pondering sort of wondering out loud why do anything? Ed Yardeni in the Financial Times, and we'll see Ed in just a moment. If the economy is doing well with the current level of interest rates, why lower them? Which is really a good question. And I think a lot of people are asking this. But right now, basically, uh, people are assuming that the neutral rate, it's sort of to your point earlier, the neutral rate is somewhere in the three and a half range, above the two and a half range. And if that's the case, it's not easing. It's just neutralizing. We just don't know. Potentially, we see more of this Fed speak come in line with what we're hearing from others who are questioning why cut. The most interesting person, though, is going to be obviously Jay Powell. After PCE, which our survey is showing is going to go up one-tenth of a percent on, on the deflator on the monthly and the year of the year, and then he's going to speak. But the markets cannot react until Monday morning. The latest on Apple, Alphabet and Meta, if you are just joining us, I want to bring you this very, very quickly from the EU. The European Union opening a full-blown investigation into the firm's compliance with strict new laws running in the power of big tech. This is the so-called Digital Markets Act. The stocks are down just a little bit. No drama here, Lisa. Apple's down by 0.6%. Alphabet's off by 0.8%. Meta, a move of more than a half of 1%. But given what we heard from the DOJ last week, on the likes of Apple. Apple is not operating from a position of strength with the EU in quite the same way it has in years gone by. I liked Alex Webb's point, this idea that it challenges the culture of a company that has thrived off innovation and moving quick and dirty and not necessarily dirty, but you know, just moving uh, on their own pace. But how much do they have to rethink that and get a little bit more paranoid in their dealings if they're under attack on all sides of the Atlantic, regardless of exactly where this goes? Yeah, I think the age of moving fast and breaking things for the likes of Meta, Apple and Alphabet, closed a long, long time ago. Correct. So then it really comes down to who has the advantage when it comes to the new technologies to move forward and dominate on that sphere. It hasn't been Apple because of the artificial intelligence they've been on the back foot. That's the latest on big tech this morning. Equities a little bit negative. We're down a third of 1% on the S&P 500. This is how the stage is set for you this morning. Yields are a little bit higher up three basis points on a 10-year, 422.76. Maybe surprising to see some dollar strength last week. We can get into that. The euro at the moment, a little bit stronger, dollar weaker on the session at least, 108. 
18. Coming up this hour, Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research posing the question, why mess with success? Henry de Trey's of Veda Partners as the Biden administration considers executive action at the border and Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence as the EU launches a probe into Apple, Alphabet and Meta. We begin with our top story. Equity markets coming off the last week of the year, the best week of the year. Investors looking ahead to Friday when Fed Chair Jay Powell speaks and we get the core PCE deflator. Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research writing this in the Financial Times. At this Nirvana level, all is right with the US economy because it is growing while inflation remains moderate. If the economy is doing well with the current level of interest rates, why lower them? Ed Yardeni, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more. A fantastic piece in the FT. Enjoyed reading over Thank it you. when it came out a little bit earlier this morning. You say why mess with success. Can I get your base case? Do you think they will mess with success? Well, based on what I heard coming uh, in the presser, uh, the press conference that uh, Jay Powell had, it seems as though uh, he at least uh, is uh, continuing to uh, tell us all that uh, they are probably are going to lower interest rates. Um, and uh, that kind of, again, raises the question, uh, exactly why is that? I mean, we had a hot CPI and PPI uh, in a, a few days before his uh, press conference, and yet notwithstanding that, he expressed confidence that uh, all, all is well. Uh, and he, he's right about the economy. The economy is doing absolutely fine. Uh, I, I think there's uh, some Fed officials who believe uh, in the concept of real interest rates, that if uh, the inflation continues to come down, uh, then real, rate, real rates will be restrictive and that might cause a recession. So I, I'm concluding that the Fed put might actually be back. So if they do go forward and mess with success, given that you believe the Fed put is back, does it really matter? Is it equities up and up and up and away? No, it's 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 fine for the for the economy. I think inflation is still going to moderate, though. I think they're taking a chance here. There's with, with oil prices going up the way they have. Uh, that's that's an area that can always spill over to the rest of the economy. So I I don't think they want to get get everybody thinking about the possibility of inflation coming back. But uh, yeah, I think th this is starting to possibly uh, be reminiscent of the 1990s. And if you ask me where we are in the 1990s, I think we're at December 5th, 1996, where uh, Alan Greenspan asked, how do we know if it's irrational exuberance? And I'm concerned that uh, the market uh, would go up too fast. Uh, I mean, it's, it's great on the way up. Uh, melt, melt ups are wonderful, but uh, by definition, they can lead to meltdowns. And so that's where my concern is. Look, I, I've been forecasting 5,400 by, by year end. I mean, we can get there by the end of the week, the, the way things are going. Well, but just to sort of sit a little bit, Ed, on what you were talking about with respect to commodities or oil prices. Yeah. We've seen a number of strategists, Goldman Sachs coming out and seeing the potential for a 15 percent gain in raw materials over the duration of this year, in part because the Fed is going to allow growth to continue. Correct. Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley also talking up the liking, uh, likelihood that a commodity oriented cyclical boom really gets ignited. At what point does this become a problem for the broader market with the idea of mm -hmm. inflation coming back? Well, I'm not that worried about the inflation story because I think certainly on the good side, China is going to continue to export deflation. Uh, we continue to see that their producer price index is negative. We continue to see that uh, import prices uh, for the U.S. coming in from China, uh, those are negative on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, China's in a pretty uh, serious uh, recession. Uh, they're really in a property depression, kind of similar to what happened in Japan a while ago and in the United States. And it takes years to offset or to come out of that kind of deflationary experience. So I'm not particularly worried about uh, price inflation. I'm more concerned about asset inflation. You know, it's not just the stock market that's on a tear. It's also gold, it's Bitcoin, uh, the, the spread between uh, high yield uh, corporate bonds and the treasuries is, ex is extremely narrow. So that's where the Fed's running a risk here. I, I think there should be three mandates. If they're gonna have a mandate to keep inflation down, price inflation down, keep unemployment rate down, they also have to be concerned about financial stability. Ed, when you look at the take from Mohamed el and he told us on Friday, it might not be this pinpoint when it comes to inflation. Maybe the Fed is now targeting a range. And he said last mm -hmm. week was a re really good um, moment where potentially you saw that right. shift. Do you agree? Do you think the Fed is now looking at a range instead of 
Well, it seems more like they're that based on what Powell said that uh, their target is still two percent. They're not putting that in a, in a range. It's just uh, Powell kept saying over and over again uh, that uh, they're shooting for two percent over time, two percent over time. He said it several times, uh, and uh, that implies that. Uh, they're willing to lower rates before they actually get to two percent. Whereas the message before seemed to be that uh, they're not going to lower rates until they're actually at two percent or so close to it and so comfortable that it's going to stay there uh, that uh, they can go ahead and, and, and ease. So I think the message right now is uh, pretty pretty ambiguous, qu quite honestly. It does kind of make me wonder, you know, what do they know that I don't know? Uh, what, what's the rush to lower rates? The answer to that, Ed, is maybe nothing, as you know, because they're often surprised mm -hmm. by many things. Ed, I just want to know, right. given everything you've said in the last five minutes or so, what are you advocating for in equity markets? What are you advocating for now from here mm -hmm. to year end? Well, I'm still going to use 5,400. I mean, obviously, we were only, you know, what, two, three percent away from that. Uh, but I'm uh, I think it's still a bull market. I think uh, by and next year we'll be looking at 6,000, maybe 6,500 by the, the year after that. So I think we're still in a bull market and I, I think you stay invested. And so, if we get a melt up, uh, well, well, we'll have to discuss whether it's time to take some profits uh, before a meltdown. But that's that's a risk scenario right now. It's not the most likely scenario. So where does the financial stability point come into play? How concerned are you about that? Well, I, I think uh, it's it, it is kind of like the 1990s in that regard, but it's, it's not 1999. It's more like 1996. Uh, so we're, we're we may be early on in the financial instability issue here, but things move pretty quickly these days, and everybody knows the history of the stock market. They know knows what happened in the 1990s, and uh, if the Fed really uh, you know gives us a, a rate cut before we're expecting it. Uh, I think you'll see the market moving a lot higher. How much are you concerned about bonds waking up to the idea of something of a range, of the idea of stickier mm -hmm. inflation? Right. Well, I think the bond market uh, is uh, happy to see the inflation coming down. Uh, and I think uh, the bond market is struggling the way all of us are with the Fed's message. What do they really want to do here? Uh, you know, the, the FOMC statement made it, made it sound like uh, we're, we're going to wait until we, we, we have the data that gives us confidence that inflation is coming down. And, and Powell modified that statement uh, by saying that, you know, things probably are going to work out in that direction. And this just sounds like extend the cycle, which raises a question about the cycle that I'd like your input on. Right. Here, a lot of people come on this program and say we're late cycle. I think Lisa's asked the question a few times. Just how late are we actually, Ed, given the conversation we're having? Well, I think uh, we've we've discovered over the past couple of years that history doesn't always repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And uh, you know, we we are, I think, just somewhere in the middle of the cycle. I don't think we're 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 late. I think the economy is still showing uh, plenty of signs that inflation is coming down. But you know, you have to put everything in a global context. It's not just uh, the, this the same old U.S. business cycle. It's you have to put it in the context of what's going on in China, what's going on in Europe, what's going on in the geopolitics. Ed Yardani, if you had any research. Ed, thank you, sir, giving us lots to think about. If we are mid-cycle, when the history books are written, when this chapter is closed, are we going to look back at this as a mid-cycle adjustment or the first in a series of cuts at the end of one? I asked a panel last week of investors exactly where we are in the cycle. How do you even understand what the cycle is? And they all had completely different answers. And they didn't know where we were in the cycle, whether there was a cycle, whether there were just lots of different cycles, depending on the market and the slice of market, which gives you a sense of How what long did this go on for? It went on for, <laughs> it was a fascinating panel. I'm sure. No, it, went, it went on for a while. I mean, this was, this is the level of disagreement among people who have been in this market for decades, because it is so unclear exactly where we are in this cycle and what this cycle even looks like relative to others. That interview was an echo of what we heard from Bob Michael at JP Morgan. We said to Bob, when was the last time you were this bullish? He paused, took a think about things, and he said the mid-2000s. Ask Ed Yardeni, where are we right now? What's it remind you of? He says the 90s. Where in the 90s? Mid-90s. So we're talking about the foundation before the bubble, the years just before things started to get distorted. So by, before the rip, before the, pl before the crash, this is where it's sort of a muddled message if you're worried about financial stability because everyone sees it coming, that there's going to be a problem. Well, they're both constructive now because right now, 
No problem. Exactly. Apparently nothing to see here. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. The S&P could hit 6,000 this year, according to Goldman Sachs. Strategists led by David Costin are sticking with their year-end target of 5,200, but have a scenario in which tech mega caps could lead the index up another 15%. The S&P 500 is up almost 10% this year and closed Friday above 5,230. That's already left many strategists' year-end forecasts in the dust. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is set to visit China next month for meetings with senior leaders, according to reporting from Politico. The trip follows Yellen's meetings in Beijing last July, which resulted in the formation of a working group with China promising, quote, frank and substantive discussions on matters involving economic and financial policy. And Shohei Otani is set to speak to media today for the first time since the illegal gambling allegations involving the baseball star's former interpreter emerged. Otani's interpreter was fired last week following claims from the Japanese player's legal team that he had been the victim of a, quote, massive theft. Major League Baseball said they are investigating the matter, while the IRS confirmed the interpreter and the alleged illegal bookmaker are under criminal investigation. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. I think almost always tread carefully around stories like this, but there's something bizarre about this story, no? On pretty much every level. And then they're also kicking him out at a time when everyone's gambling much more because it's legal and sort of has... So why do it? Yeah, I don't get it. There's a lot of confusing aspects here. Kind of strange. All right, we'll leave that one there. Maybe wise. (laughs) Up next on this program, President Biden's next steps on the border. We have a broken immigration system and we need to fix it. Members of the United States Senate those considered to be very conservative with others came to a bipartisan resolution, but they're refusing to put it up for a vote. That conversation up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Live from New York City, equities pulling back by a third of 1%, kick off a shortened trading week. On the S&P 500, we're down about a third of 1%. Yields are higher by three basis points on a 10-year, 422.76. Under surveillance this morning, President Biden's next steps on the border. We have a broken immigration system and we need to fix it. Members of the United States Senate, those considered to be very conservative with others, came to a bipartisan resolution but they're refusing to put it up for a vote. As of right now, is that executive action on the border still on the table? Could we see that? That does not absolve the fact that the real fix is gonna be when Congress acts. Mm -hmm. Still on the table though? Uh, Yeah, for consideration. It's the latest this morning. Axios reporting President Biden is still considering a string of executive actions on the southern border after the House failed to act as immigration remains a key issue heading into November. Meanwhile, Mexico's president telling CBS that Trump's talk of a border wall is campaign rhetoric. Henrietta Trey joins us now for more from Veda Partners. Henrietta, thank you for being with us. Can we just get into this? The options on the table for the president on the border going into November, what are they? You know, I think at this point, based on the dysfunction we're seeing at the House Republican conference with members up and quitting, uh, in some cases months earlier than they even anticipated just to get out of Dodge, the administration has to start operating on the assumption that Congress is incapable of passing legislation through the House on anything beyond just the bill to keep the lights on, which they did last weekend. Um, Right now, we know that Speaker Johnson has said he will bring a bill to the floor on Ukraine potentially after this two week recess. But we've heard that for months now. We even have had a bipartisan um, immigration bill. I, and they keep saying, you know, we want to see action on the southern border before we provide aid to Ukraine. And there is a groundswell of support from Republicans for aid to Ukraine in really powerful circles like minority leader Mitch McConnell. But the real reality is that Congress on the House side just cannot move legislation. So I think, um, as the vice president was saying in that clip there, Executive action is something that they have to increasingly acknowledge, as do all Americans, is probably your only path forward. A comprehensive bill this cycle in an election year is not realistic, um, in my opinion. How does Biden push for an executive order, potentially, if we look at what Axios reporting, this is still something that they're mulling over. How does he do that at the same time, maintain the support of progressives heading into November? 
You know, what's really interesting is some of the data that we are seeing out of key swing states, uh, not to pivot too much, but in states like Arizona, where we have a massively important Senate race, and obviously it's a critical state for President Biden, and it's not necessarily the progressives he has to worry about there, but the moderates in order to win that state and make his path to the White House uh, feasible. They are giving Carrie Lake, you know, 77 uh, percent approval on the immigration issue or not approval, but you know, favorability on that issue. But with the economy, it's one of the rare states where you see Democrats actually getting credit for the state of the U.S. economy. And Ruben Galeo, the Democrat there, gets higher points than Lake on issues about handling the economy. So I think it's a message that they can have they're going to have to splice and dice across individual states to see which ones resonate. You know, in a lot of states, the Democratic voters are more concerned about maybe the uh, Hamas Israel conflict. They're more worried about health care, abortion, um, whereas in redder states or amongst Republicans, that's where you see your divide on immigration um, and crime. So it really is speaking to two totally different audiences, which speaks to the polarization of America right now. Given these are likely the top two issues in November, immigration, the economy, and you're seeing in a key swing state like Arizona, Republicans are winning out when it comes to immigration, but Democrats are actually winning out when it comes to the economy. What other states do you see that kind of divergence? Um, This is one of the unique ones where there are, you know, 50 point swings on the issues um, between immigration and the economy. And it really is more partisan than anything. Uh, But obviously, the key states to watch are going to be Michigan, where you have a larger focus on the Israel-Hamas issue. Um, There's Pennsylvania, where immigration is competing neck and neck with uh, the economy as a top issue. Um, Ohio, I think they have, obviously, the union and auto issues, along with the economy. But immigration and crime is right up there, which is why Uh, Former President Trump pulls ahead by about 10 points now. But interestingly, in that state, uh, you see Sherrod Brown with a two point lead over his Republican challengers in the Senate. And this is something I think is fascinating. Down ballot, the president is underwater or tied, you know, one, two points away from Trump uh, at the top of the ticket. But down ballot for Democrats in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Georgia, um, Georgia. Arizona, Nevada, those states where there are Senate races, not Georgia, excuse me, but the races where there's Senate races, those members are pulling ahead four or five, sometimes even 10 points versus their Republican counterparts. So something is going on where at the top of the ticket, the President Biden is not getting um, the same amount of support that Democrats down ballot are. And in America, we don't split the ticket anymore. Indeed, in 2016, not a single senator went to D.C. from a different party than the president that they elected. So uh, something is either going to be a massive split ticket voting cycle this year or President Biden has a lot more room to run on the upside, as evidenced by the way that members on the down ballot are running against their Republican counterparts. Just to come full circle, then, there's this question of, okay, given that kind of backdrop, what can actually get done? And what's Mike Johnson's role at a time where his own party members are threatening to oust him in a similar move? to what we saw from Kevin McCarthy. If the same kind of thing happens again, will Democrats come to the rescue of Mike Johnson? I don't see any reason to anticipate that Democrats would vote for anyone other than Hakeem Jeffries. Um, I I think with one vote margin now to deal with, the fault will be on Republicans if they choose to go the route of ousting the speaker again. And uh, quite frankly, I think they know that. So while Marjorie Taylor Greene has her proposal out there, you saw much less support for it this time around than there was under Kevin McCarthy. Uh, This is not how it felt with John Boehner. It's not how it felt with Paul Ryan. Um, This is a, you know, we kept the lights on. We got the deal that we agreed to last year. Let's just now leave town, effectively go campaign and make it through November. They're not going to pass any meaningful legislation is my expectation. So we'll jawbone about the southern border. Um, I think there's a lot of effort to get Ukraine bill passed. But I don't know that Johnson's going to be under the fight like he is right now. And about, they're about to go home for two weeks. And that does have the um, effect of lowering the temperature in D.C. when they get back. It'll be after the Easter recess. I think things will have simmered by then. I lose track over how much vacation they get. Henrietta, thank you. <laughs> Henrietta Trace there, a Vader Partners on the calendar in Congress. Can we talk about no labels, the candidate, the potential candidate, a movement without a leader? When are they going to pick one? It's a movement that's gaining momentum because there's these double haters. People don't like Trump or Biden, but we're still waiting on them to pick a leader. And depending on who they pick, that will either blunt their momentum or potentially we could see their momentum pick up. If we get a credible third option, who does that take votes from? Depends who the option is. 
And we're seeing that right now with RFK, who he's pulling from. And at, in some states, he actually pulls from both. He has this Kennedy legacy name, but he also has some of these far-right individuals who also like him. Interesting. Equities right now, down a third of 1%. Enjoy your vacation. Two weeks. It's like school, isn't it? Down in Washington. And it, it chills them out. They're, they're feeling better about <laughs> they, themselves. They're, it's like they're, a time they're, out. Like, <laughs> they're refreshed. <laughs> they're refreshed. Sure. Like, we yeah. want you to be refreshed from that's, all of your hard work doing stuff. Mm. Coming up, comes out. the EU launching investigations into Apple, Google and Meta. The latest up next. Be careful what you say in a commercial break, just in case, you know. I think that was picked up. Maybe. Equities right now on the S&P, negative a third of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, we're down by about 0.6%. Just a little bit softer here. Off the back of five days of gains on the Nasdaq 100, another all-time high at a close on Friday. Into the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Yields look a little something like this in Treasuries. Two-year yield right now, higher by three basis points, 4.6190. A 10-year up by three basis points, 4.2296. Just want to finish on foreign exchange and just have a little look at uh, dollar yen, just very quickly. Dollar yen right now at about 151.31. We are negative there by not even 0.1%. So this is what verbal intervention buys you these days, which is not much at all. This is what the Vice Finance Minister for International Affairs had to say a little bit earlier on today. The current weakening of the yen is not in line with fundamentals, is clearly driven by speculation. We will take appropriate action against excessive fluctuations without ruling out any options. I always say verbal intervention for it to be credible needs to have some kind of policy thrust behind it. And I'm not sure, Lisa, what that is. The communication last week was pretty clear. They sort of pushed that rate over the finish line, but basically were dovish, all other things being equal. Pantheon Macro came out over the weekend and was talking about Japan's wage price spiral still is in its infancy. So they're still grappling with this question of how much inflation there is, even as they adopt a pretty dovish stance. It's something they're nervous about killing off. That's the big difference, and we've said this a million times, between the BOJ and the Federal Reserve. You've put this well, conditioned by circumstances. If there is anyone who's been conditioned by circumstances, it would be Japan. After decades of lost growth, decades of last autonomism, they don't want to stymie that. Once in a generation opportunity to reset inflation expectations, are they really going to come straight out the gate and start hiking by 50 basis points meeting after meeting? I think that we got the answer, which is the yeah. reason why the currency is responding in the way that it is. And so at what point really the question is, does the uh, Japanese authorities really, when do they come out and they really fight back against the weakening that we've seen in the end? That's the latest in Japan. Under surveillance this morning, a steady diet of Fed speak on tap this week. We'll hear from Bostick, Goolsby, Cook, Waller and Daly. Ahead of remarks from Chairman Powell on Friday. On the data front, markets close for Good Friday, but we'll still get personal income and spending data, as well as the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, the core PCE deflator. And I guess, Bramo, this whole week is going to build up to that moment. That's the one to watch on Friday morning. And people can trade that coming in on Sunday night or whenever <laughs> they come back because it will all be off. But, you know, here's the issue that basically we're talking about a data independent Fed. They say they're data dependent, and yet the hotter than expected inflation reads don't seem to really materially affect them. So this raises this question about what these data points are really going to mean to markets. Of course, we already know what this is going to look like because Jay Powell said so. But and just going forward, how does the balance of risks shift based on the recent sh uh, pivot in communication? I mentioned in the previous hour, I think a speech to watch a little bit later is maybe Governor Cook of the Federal Reserve. Just the title of that seems to be dual mandate. I'm interested in that. If the dual mandate comes into conflict, which one are they going to have a bias towards? Based on what I heard from Chairman Powell last week, the bias at the moment seems to be to prevent weakness in the labour market. And if we get any, they're going to respond. That's what he said. Basically, that would be a reason to move. And that was new. He hadn't said that before. It's notable this comes at a time that inflation is still higher than a lot of people would like to see. Torsten Slock just putting out uh, a piece talking about how wage inflation is still sticky around 5 percent in the United States, looking at New York Fed data not necessarily pointing to that clear immaculate disinflation. Let's get you a mover. I want to have a look at shares of United, slightly lower <laughs> on the heels of reporting from Bloomberg that the FAA is weighing measures to curb growth at the airline following a string of safety incidents. Such measures could include preventing United from adding new routes and preventing the airline from flying paying customers on newly delivered aircraft. United declining to comment on the potential restrictions. AMH, we're lower by almost 4%. And you have to think, if this is going to be a clampdown then on growth, what does that mean for, I know Lisa, you're thinking of it because you're trying to book up all your holiday travel. 
What does this mean for prices? If their roots are being clawed back, if they cannot expand growth, and we're going into peak summer travel. It's not my airline, so, you know, they can go fish. <laughs> we know your airline. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to mention your airline. There's you want chain... me to mention your airline? No, 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 please I won't mention your airline. There's a chain effect, though. If prices yeah. go up on one airline, it's going to impact What's them all. What's interesting about this story is we've been looking at the issues that we've seen with Boeing over the last few months, and we've been trying to work out who's ultimately responsible, not for that single incident with Alaska Air, but more broadly, the responsibility of the airline the responsibility of the plane maker. And what we're seeing in this instance is some of the issues happening at the moment. On this front, there's going to be an investigation about it, potentially, is going to be down to the airline. It comes also at a time where we're still trying to work through what the consequences of the pandemic era really are. And one of them has been a loss of a lot of seasoned professionals in certain service industries, in particular the airlines. And we think about all of the layoffs and all the attrition, how much talent was lost during that period. And we talk about that with the Boeing factory. I wonder how much that's true for some of the airlines as well, which is rather petrifying for people who fly a lot and want to be sure that their you know, panels aren't going to come flying oh, off. Oh, big time. Every time we've done a segment with Boeing, I've done like a, a warning. Turn the volume down <laughs> yes. if you're going to fly a little bit later. That's the latest on United. Their stock is down by close to 4%. Here's the latest on Apple, Google and Meta. Under investigation, the European Union announcing probes into the firm's under the Blocks Digital Markets <laughs> Act that could lead to the tech giants facing fines of up to 10% of global revenue. The EU's antitrust chief saying, quote, we suspect that the suggested solutions put forward by the three companies do not fully comply with the Digital Markets Act. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now for more. So Mandeep, help frame this for us, because I think initially Lisa and I were talking about this. Initially, we sensed, here we go again, it's the EU going after major tech players, not a big deal, small fine, walk away. Why is this different to you? Well, so they just rolled out the Digital Markets Act in the first week of March, and now they are opening up a commission to investigate whether these companies are actually in compliance or not. And I think the focus here is on the gatekeepers. So primarily Alphabet and Apple, and to an extent Meta. I mean, think of it this way. Alphabet and Apple have the operating system. They have the default apps that go on your phone. And they uh, have the option to keep those as defaults. Users aren't even allowed to change those defaults. Now, I, I, I think the other aspect of it is the commissions they charge on the app store. So there are two burning issues here around what the EU is focused on, but clearly these companies have to change behavior to comply with that. This is important. It's not the fines per se, it's behavior shifts. And that's what we heard from Alex Webb too. What types of behavioral shifts do you expect and how does that really affect the future profitability of some of the tech behemoths? Yeah, I mean, look at the commissions these companies charge. So every transaction get, that goes through Apple App Store is a 30% cut for Apple. Same thing for Alphabet. And now they are lowering the commissions for smaller developers, but for larger developers, it's still 30%. Now, what EU is saying is if there's a third party App Store, that wants to roll out ad, apps and a payment system, they should be allowed to do that. And I think these companies have to open up their platforms to allow third-party app stores. It may pose a security issue, which is the argument that Apple and Google are going to take, is their operating system becomes less secure as a result of third-party app stores. So that's the push and pull of it. But the other aspect of it is the default apps. Why does uh, Android operating system have Maps, Google Maps as the default, and how easily can users be allowed to change those defaults? So it's always been the case whenever you own an operating system, it was the same with Microsoft. You roll out your browser. Same thing with Apple. You know, so why is Safari the default browser? Why can't you change it? So all these things are at play here, the defaults and the commissions, I would say, predominantly. And the focus is on gatekeepers. Meta is not a gatekeeper, but it does share data across its family of apps. It owns four apps with more than 2 billion monthly active users. Why is it data sharing? What are the consents required to share data? And all that is under focus in the EU. What's more worrisome, the DOJ or the EU? I would say EU in the interim, simply because they have a Digital Markets Act, and they are trying to make sure whether these companies are complying or not. So I feel imminent fines are going to be imposed if these companies say, oh, we, we can't comply. The DOJ trial is going to take years. And, and you know, that's What's where, imminent? Well, imminent is the fact that these companies have to change behavior like change defaults or allow for third-party app stores. And if they don't, then there will be fines. Something I know that you're focused on, the potential for partnerships in this space as well. Yeah. Specifically one between Apple and Google. 
Gemini, the AI partnership that we've been talking about for a number of weeks now. Yeah. Do you think this is going to be a huge roadblock, a hurdle to those kind of partnerships? I mean, talking about change of behavior, how do you allow these companies to share data for training large language models, to do inferencing, to roll out a voice assistant that everyone is so excited about on your phones? So I, I think it will be very hard for Apple to make a case that it can continue to use uh, Google, even though you know Google is paying $20 billion in traffic acquisition costs still to Apple. So that behavior hasn't changed. But you could argue it makes it harder for them to collaborate going forward. Where would that leave Apple in September and finding a new iPhone? Does this compromise them? I mean, they have to do things organically. There's no doubt that Apple has to invest in developing its own large language model. It has to implement AI and voice assistant, leverage Siri more and more in, in inferencing side of things. And uh, they are behind. So I think the fact that they were looking to use Google probably uh, is, is now seen uh, somewhat of a setback given you know, all the scrutiny that regulators have. There's a larger issue here, and it's something we were talking about with Alex, this question of whether this whole action from the European Union disproportionately affects Apple simply because of the other baggage that's currently affecting Apple. More than, say, Google, even though those shares are down around the similar six-tenths of a percent pre-market trading. Is that your sense, that this is just sort of a one, two, three, four, five punch for Apple that makes it difficult for them? I think with Apple, the scrutiny is really around their App Store commissions. With Google, they are involved in pretty much everything that EU is raising, whether it's your app store commissions or your default apps or your ad tech systems. So I think uh, Google is probably affected more. And look, they have 30% revenue coming from just these services that they are rolling out in the EU. Apple is more hardware centric. Yes, they have services bucket, but it's still relatively small compared to a Google or Meta. I've got no idea where this is going, and this is really a question. Does this feel like end of empire type stuff to you for some of these big names that maybe they're not going to be the big winners of the next big wave of technology? Well, their ability to do acquisitions is being reined in, their ability to tie things together, whether you know it's the bundling aspect of it, that's being reined in. So clearly, I think if you're a hardware maker and you want to vertically integrate, you're not going to be able to do that very uh, you know, carefully uh, as you were able to do that before with Apple. That, I mean, Apple's value proposition is all uh, vertical integration. Now I think uh, it's going to be very hard for somebody to vertically integrate and not open up the platform because that's what regulators are focused on. To John's point earlier about AI, end of empire type stuff, there is new research out that when you look at top talent when it comes to AI, it's all coming from China. They're overtaking the United States. Are they the big winners when you see the EU and the US going after you know, their Western champions? Probably not, because when it comes to large language models specifically, they don't have the data. So one of the things going for the US-based companies is they have the data when it comes to training large language models, the likes of Meta. I mean, there's a reason why EU is going after all these companies for data sharing, because this data is so valuable that they have harnessed, and now it's going to be used even going forward with large language models. I don't think China has that data. Yes, the domestic data is there, but they can roll out their large language models outside of the region. Should Sam Altman buy Nokia? And we'll go back a couple of decades and do the phone business again. What do you think? I think Just throwing uh, it out there. It, it's probably uh, too far of a stretch. I, uh, he's got other things that he could do, you know, with all the funding he's getting. Probably. Mandeep, yeah. thank you. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. You never know, Bramo. You never know. Well, I just want to, to your point about the end of empire, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, OK, what does this mean that they're on their pathway to the new utility creation, essentially? This is essentially, if they're the bread and butter of the economy in a certain way, how much are regulators saying, we want you to look just like AT&T? Yeah. I mean, I'm joking, but what Mandeep said about potentially the new iPhone being compromised, there can be some interesting questions for the Apple bulls who were sort of pinning their hopes on that big upgrade cycle happening in September if they adopt that AI push. We can get Dan Ives on and Let's see what Dan's him. got to say. I, I bet he's just now bearish. I'm sure he's got a very different view on things, that's for sure. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Donald Trump faces a deadline today to post the bond to cover the civil fraud judgment against him. If Trump can't pony up roughly half a billion dollars, New York's attorney general could start the process of seizing the former president's assets. Trump is also set to appear in a Manhattan court today in a bid to dismiss charges related to his hush money case. 
Vice President Kamala Harris is warning Israel against a major attack on the Gaza city of Rafah, where more than a million Palestinians have sought refuge since the war against Hamas began. Israel says it must send troops into Rafah because it's the last remaining bastion of Hamas. Israeli intelligence estimates there are around 5 to 8,000 Hamas fighters and group leaders in the city. Four men have appeared in court charged with carrying out a terrorist attack at a Moscow concert venue where at least 137 people were killed. Two of the men pleaded guilty. Islamic State has claimed responsibility for Friday's attack as Russian officials continue to suggest a Ukrainian role in the massacre, a claim Kiev denies. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Up next on this program, Fed speak, following a dovish chair pal. The demons are at work. People are worried about a reacceleration, or we eventually will roll into recession. They're waiting for a better buying opportunity. That conversation up next, Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management says he feels great. He feels really good. Sort of hasn't been this bullish since the mid 2000s. Not alone. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Starting the week a little bit lower on the S&P 500, negative by a third of 1% on the S&P. Yields a little bit higher by four basis points, 423.75. Spent the weekend, not the whole weekend, just parts of the weekend. Do have a little bit of a life, but spent some of the weekend. A <laughs> little bit. Just a little bit, tiny bit. Trying too hard now, right? <laughs> Carry on, just Let me get your it own out. hole. Spent some of the weekend <laughs> thinking about Rushing it. if Mohamed Alerian is right, is it good or bad for bonds? What does it ultimately mean for fixed income? If this Fed is willing to tolerate a range of inflation of somewhere between 2 and 3%, what does it mean for fixed income? The answer is it depends. And as he said, even that he saw the 10-year within range actually making sense. Longer term, what it strikes me as is it's not a good proposition for bonds. Because longer term, there is this question of the Fed's ability to counter downturns with the same kind of rate cuts as they have in the past. Can I just reiterate, spent some of the weekend <laughs> Just thinking about that. Went to watch the football in New Jersey. Very <laughs> what, impressed. What else did you That's do? That's the only very reason impressed. why I know you have a little bit of a life. Red Bull Arena. Very, yeah. very impressed. You can talk about anything else. Sung the Italian walk. national anthem, hand across my chest. Gigi Buffon was there. Chiellini, Fabio Cannavaro. Fantastic. Chiellini, yeah, nice, nice to see amazing. everyone. That was amazing, right? It sounds like you had a great vacation. Nice to see everyone. Great vacation, that I was said. It. Weekend. Spent some of the weekend thinking about bonds, too. <laughs> Under surveillance this morning, Fed speak following a dovish chair pal. The demons are at work. People are worried about a reacceleration, or we eventually will roll into recession. They're waiting for a better buying opportunity. I think we can toss away the last 15 or so years and look at the period pre-financial crisis when there will be a demand for capital, there will be a cost to it, and there will be a productive use to it. So I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Here's the latest this morning. Fed speak returning this week. We'll hear from Bostick, Goresby, Cook, Waller and Daly before Chair Powell again on Friday. Investors looking to see where the committee stands ahead of core PCE. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge to round out the week. Son of Desire, Franklin Templeton writing this, quote, the last mile of disinflation is going to be a lot harder than markets expect. And the Fed will need to be very patient on monetary easing. The new equilibrium we're trending to will will have markedly higher rates than we've been used to in the pre-inflation surge period. So I'm pleased to say, join us now for more. So now let's get into that. I just want to start with the first piece yeah. of it. Ultimately, if the Federal Reserve is willing to accept higher inflation for longer, and you believe this journey could be a whole lot longer, where does it leave your view on fixed income? Actually, you know, I, I like fixed income here. The only thing is people have to adjust what they expect to get out of fixed income. It's time for fixed income to do what it says on the can, which is to deliver kind of boring returns. So I think it's largely carry. We are not looking for massive capital gains, certainly from here on. Where across the curve do you prefer? So not the front end or further out, 10 year plus? So, you know, we have been neutral for a while, but between 425, 450, we have been adding duration. We've been slowly adding to that duration position. Clearly, uh, spreads are extremely tight, but one has to look for pockets of value wherever we can find them. Uh, unusually and terribly tight, <laughs> let's say right now, on most of credit spreads. This is a reason why I find it compelling that you see actually the neutral rate is being closer to 4% yeah. than 2.5%. 
And yet you still are investing in longer term bonds that are close to that 4% neutral rate. How do you square those two ideas? So, you know, we're, like I said, we're neutral and we're only slowly getting there. Now, why would I say that long term rates might end up between 425, 450? Mainly because there are some distinct differences in technicals now relative to pre-GFC. Globally, we have interest rates which are way, way lower, and you have a massive amount of outstanding liquidity, which isn't really going to go away. The Fed is talking about sitting on a balance sheet, which is far larger than it used to. It continues to actually, if, it's decide, if it decides to ease off on balance sheet tightening sooner than bring that balance sheet back to something like Four trillion, say, you know, so you've got an extra couple of trillion to support if the Fed decides not to start that process of runoff of the balance sheet runoff, for want of a better, uh, better word. At, at that stage, the Fed actually continues to be a player in the bond market. So I think you've got additional sources of demand. And that's why you look at the all in yield and recognize that you're not really going to get fair value, which I would say is probably closer to five or above five. This is kind of shocking to me because pretty much every investor who has come on this show says longer term there could be risks, whether this is a mid 2000s or a mid 1990s type of scenario. But in the near term, there's no reason not to buy. It is a risk on environment across asset classes. Is there a medium term risk to this about exuberance or some other consequence? You know, the medium term risk is going to come from the fiscal side. I think that uh, issuance is a wild card. Neither the Democrats or the Republicans, essentially nobody, no politician has a desire to reduce the fiscal deficit. Longer term, that's something which we are going to be watching extremely carefully, especially if it appears that inflation really comes down even slower than I think it will come down. I'm not anticipating a reacceleration. If we got anything like that, I think that's a very significant risk. I love this take from Drew Mattis of MetLife this morning. Just writes in, so I'll, I want to sc share this quote yeah. with you. The ability of the Fed to manage inflation above 2% assumes a level of control and understanding of inflation that they do not possess. It's called hubris, and it doesn't tend to end well. Can you talk to me about your understanding of inflation and whether you think they possess an understanding of inflation that would allow them to control inflation somewhere between 2 and 3%? So, you know, here's the thing. Uh, I'm an economist and I think that uh, a certain degree of being humble is necessary. None of us get it, right? None of us completely understand this. What my baseline has been for a while is that it's not purely monetary. It is fiscal and monetary. The move from nine to around four was always about the low-hanging fruit and the supply chains that Powell often alludes to. But, you know, four to two is also a function of things like wages, of the fact that financial conditions are so easy that people feel comfortable continuing to go out and spend. And you have consumer demand, which is pretty robust. And that's why maintaining between two and four without that reacceleration certainly is a risky proposition. And that's why I think that the Fed is going to be a bit more prudent, I would hope it is, uh, and only start easing much later in the year than the June that markets are currently pricing. So now I'm looking at the price of oil going up steadily. Mm -hmm. We're now north of $85 on Brent. How concerned are you about supply shocks and that impact on inflation? So supply shocks are just uh, just an added variable. It is 85, and you know, with what's going on in the Middle East, uh, certainly, and uh, of course, the, the always background of Russia and Ukraine, you could get an additional supply uh, supply shock effect coming from oil. But historically, those have been somewhat more temporary, right? Uh, unless they stick around for long enough to get us to second round effects. I'd say that if we got a sustained shock to oil, we'd get into a very difficult situation because that does have negative impact on demand as well. So you get a growth shock together with an inflation shock at that point. And that is a pretty ugly environment. So now this feels like a little sustained. bit of a change for you. Can I just finish there? Yeah. Typically, you're going against the grain. Do you feel like the market yeah. has moved in your direction? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, at this stage, it's difficult to be. I, I, I don't think I was ever against the grain simply to be against the grain. Over time, I'd say the market has moved significantly closer to where I have been calling it. I now see the extent of divergence coming more over the medium term, so over next year and the year after, where I continue to see, you know, the Fed talking about 2.6. I hear 
two and a half, two point six constantly in the market. I hear that people, people who look at commercial real estate, they're horrified at the idea that neutral Fed funds might be closer to four because that's another you know shoe that might need to drop if stable neutral rates are closer to four than less than three. And I think that one I do have a strong conviction on. And uh, that's the one area, uh, Jonathan, that I think I'm still somewhat separate from markets. Interesting. You're always one of the best. So now this was great. Thanks, Thanks for catching up with us. Thanks Thomas so much. there at Franklin Templeton. The conversation continues. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance Up next. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Duncan Aldred, the Buick and GMC Global Vice President. Neil Dutter of Renmac and Stefan Slowinski of BNP Paribas. That conversation and a whole lot more still to come from New York City. This is Bloomberg. I feel great because I feel post-financial crisis, we've sort of been in a la-la land. What's been winning has continued to win and win, and that's been a great environment for passive investment. Although valuations are high, they could go higher. Stocks are increasingly priced for perfection. It's very difficult to think of not owning U.S. equity risk. The momentum factor is very strong right now. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. This is like torture for equity market bears, isn't it? It really is. Just every single hour, Bob Michael or JP Morgan, I feel great. <laughs> Just have bull on. He was bearish a year ago. Let's be clear about that. This is a big change for Bob. Now, the bearishness is just not being bullish enough. I mean, that's basically what bearish means. And we see upgrade after upgrade on Wall Street as everyone reassesses what the pivot from the Fed actually means. New upgrade, Lisa. Let's talk about it. Oppenheimer raising the S&P 500 year-end target to 5,500. I think that might be John Stolfus. If it is John, John was at 5,200 before, and you talked to him about upgrading his target and potentially here we are. Yeah, I mean, basically he didn't want to get ahead of himself, but he said, I'm going to revise things and maybe I will. I mean, it's not that much upside left from here to get there. I mean, as we heard from Ed Yardeni, it didn't take long before we got to, uh, we could get to 5,400, his goal, by the end of this week. Big headline coming from Boeing. Let's move to the stock. Let's get Boeing up on the screen if we can in the pre-market. This just coming in. Boeing's Dave Calhoun announces his intent to step down as a C. EO. That just crossed into Bloomberg right now. The stock is higher in the pre-market by 2.5%. The Boeing CEO, Dave Calhoun, announcing his intent to step down, Lisa, as CEO. And everyone's saying, what took so long? Because essentially, everyone was wondering why he was still there after all of the mishaps and the idea that this is a cultural problem that doesn't yet have a seen bottom. And that, I think, is really now a question of, OK, who comes in? And what's sort of the uh, the cleaning house uh, effort that they're going to? This is with. also taking place. Remember, as the board is doing almost a listening tour, going around the country, talking to other, talking to airline executives. We also note from this is that the chairman of the board uh, is also resigning and will leave the board at Boeing's annual meeting in May. So there's a number of people in this announcement that are going to be moving at the very top level of Boeing, Jonathan. The CEO is saying he's been considering the transition for some time now. The CEO referring to the Alaska Airlines flight 1282 as a watershed moment. I remember the conversations we had immediately after this, Lisa, and we were on air and we were talking about how long it would take for this plane to get back in the sky. And some analysts on the south side were talking like weeks. Then Brooke Sutherland came on at Bloomberg Opinion and Brooke was the first to say there's a cultural issue at play here that might need to be addressed that runs a whole lot deeper than just a one-off incident. And these are the kind of changes that I think Brooke at the time was pointing towards. And she was talking about how institutionally since 2019, they've really seen them manifest with an even greater manifestation since the pandemic. A lot of questions remain. Who replaces some of these officials? How do they change the culture? Have they identified all of the problems and what led to that? It still is an open question. Remember documents missing that the uh, federal authorities were looking for? I mean, it raises this question of how do you get to a place where you can grow again and not just uh, put out fires? So if you're just joining us, there's so many different headlines here. It's hard to know where to start and when to finish. So a lot of changes at Boeing. The CEO issuing a message to employees announcing his intent to step down as CEO. This is Dave Calhoun. Basically, Calhoun is going to have this year as his last year as the CEO, saying he's been considering the transition for some time. But ultimately, the Alaska Airlines flight was a watershed moment for the company. And then Lisa, a whole host of changes around this as well, including the new chair 
Yeah, we're looking at Steve Hollenkopf, Mollenkopf uh, as the new chair, previously of Qualcomm, which is kind of interesting, also announcing uh, that Stephanie Pope was named the commercial airplane CEO. Very curious to see how this sort of indicates their effort at transformation, right? I mean, this is really going to be key as we parse through it. We'll get more details coming up. We must still respond to the Alaska Air accident with humility. The message coming from Dave Calhoun right now must include a commitment to safety and to quality. Their stock is up in the pre-market by something like 2%. We'll come back to that in just a moment. Equity futures on the S&P 500, just to reset for you. Equity is shaping up as follows on the S&P. We are a little bit negative. We're down by about a third of 1%. Yields are a little bit higher by four or five basis points now at 424.14. This hour, we'll be catching up with Jim Bianco of Bianco Research on why he's in the no landing camp. Buick and GMC Global VP Duncan Aldred on the company's push to revive China sales. And Neil Dutter of Renmac looking ahead to this week's inflation data. We'll begin with our top story coming off the back of a record-setting rally following a series of dovish central bank meetings. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research saying this, the Fed cannot randomly pick some day and cut rates. If they do, and the market thinks it is not serious about inflation, sell bonds. Fed dovishness only works if the market is convinced inflation is not a problem. Right now, it's unsure. Jim joins us now for more. Jim, are you unsure? Yeah, I am. I mean, if you look at the markets, we've got the so-called everything rally. Except one thing has not been rallying with the everything rally, and that's been the bond market. It has been kind of meandering unchanged, especially if you go back to before the uh, Fed meeting. It hears the Fed wants to cut rates. It looks at the data. It sees stronger data, higher inflation expectations. It also sees the Fed upgrading its inflation and economic growth forecasts. And I think it's wondering, is this a good idea for the Fed to be cutting rates? Because if they're not careful, they could cut rates. And if the bond market's thinking that they're unserious about inflation, we could wind up with higher yields, not lower yields. I think that's what we saw last summer when the Fed stopped raising rates on July 26th. The market was worried it was unserious about inflation. We were at 390 on the 10 year note. 90 days later, we were over 5% before it started to really believe that the inflation numbers were coming down. You said last year that disinflation was transitory. Jim, you said that. You came out very early on and said it. I wonder, Jim, what you saw at the time that led you to believe so. Just looking at the data, you're right. I mean, I was looking at headline CPI, and it has bottomed June of 2023 at 3%. And if you look at the data going forward from here, especially the March data should be very strong and you're probably not going to be below 3% until the fall, if, if not the earliest, unless price of crude oil collapses down to $50. Then you'll get there. But short of that, you're not going to be below 3%. And what I saw was just that the, the housing data was staying stickier than everybody thought. The wage data was staying stickier than everybody thought. And in oil and energy prices, which matters for headline CPI, was also not really declining to the extreme that everybody wants. And I think that's still the case as we move forward. When is it going to be something that the bond market wakes up to? Because right now it hasn't been material sell-off. And frankly, bonds have handled this pretty well. Yeah, they've handled it well, you know, you're over the last couple of weeks, which I've said it's been unsure. But of course, the 10-year yield started the year at 388. So it's up about 40 basis points for the year as we end the first quarter. Uh, the other problem or the other issue in the bond market is everybody's bullish. Everybody thinks that bond Bloomberg had a story basically about, you know, we're back in the curve steepening trade again. Everybody's losing money in that trade. But don't worry, it's going to be a good trade to wind up making. And that's really what the bond market is dealing with is a lot of bullishness right now, but data that is not supporting it. So it's going to take some time. And I think if the data continues to come in stronger than expected and the inflation data stays hotter than expected, the bond market will eventually turn towards higher yields. Well, this is really something that we were talking about with Sanal Desai, and she said that she still likes duration, actually. And the reason why is just because of the wall of money. And it's clear that there's so much liquidity in the system that's got to go somewhere, and the ball of money is just going into every risk asset as well as bonds. How do you argue against that, that that's not going to persist? Well, it is going to persist until the wall of money ends. And really, the biggest driver of that wall of money has been central bank policy. Now, I know they're doing QT, but they're also having their reverse repo facility roll off. I know this is a bit wonky. That's money that's outside the financial system that's getting pushed into the financial system that is creating more liquidity. 
That's within a couple of weeks to a month of ending. And then all of a sudden, I think the liquidity situation in the bond market or in financial markets generally is going to start to turn lower. And that wall of money is really going towards where it's treated the best, and that's cash. It's, you know, we've seen a trillion and a half dollars go into money market funds, and they just keep booming to new highs. And why shouldn't they? They're the highest point in the yield curve. And that forward-looking thinker, Tom Keene, has now got a quadruple levered cash fund. <laughs> and so I think he's got the right idea when it comes to where you should be. That's right. He had his European tour last week <laughs> celebrating. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Jim, it's good to catch up, buddy, as always. Just to Thank recap you. some breaking news, if you are just joining us moments ago, Dave Calhoun, the Boeing CEO, announcing his attempt to step down. For more, Brooke Sutherland from Bloomberg Opinion joins us now. Brooke, you pointed to this almost immediately after the Alaska Air incident. You said there might be cultural issues that need to be addressed, and you alluded to the fact that maybe there needs to be a change at the very top of the company. Brooke, you surprised this morning. I, I'm not, because I think, you know, change does start from the top, and, and I think that it, it's just been striking the degree to which Boeing has been reluctant to talk about this as a deep-rooted cultural problem. And I think you need somebody to come in to really look at everything with fresh eyes. Um, because remember, you know, Dave Calhoun has been on the board since 2009. So he's been there for a very long time. And I think this is a company that is desperately in need of some fresh perspective. But now the question is, who do they get to bring in that fresh perspective? Um, and I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of eyes directed toward Larry Culp's way, um, just given the turnaround that he's been able to orchestrate at GE. Now, I don't know if he would be interested in this because he's got a pretty great job um, at GE right now. He's about to lead an independent GE aerospace into a future that looks a lot brighter than the one that Boeing has right now. But that's the type of person that you need to really get in there and focus on the manufacturing um, that is at the heart of what Boeing does. They got a little off course um, as far as that's concerned. And you really need somebody who's going to drill down into those basics and produce airplanes that don't have any defects. How do you meet that, Brooke, with the need for industry knowledge? So I'm looking at the change as well to the commercial airlines, commercial airplanes CEO. So Stephanie Pope's been named, been at the company for nearly 30 years. Stan Deal is going to retire. What do you make of that transition? I mean, I think that's another one where it, it just was not tenable to keep the, the management in place running the commercial airplanes division because that's where a lot of the problems were emanating from. And so I think what you're seeing is Boeing trying to take accountability for the fact that there does need to be sweeping changes. Um, and it's not just the CEO. Uh, it, it goes, you know, down into further into the ranks of management. And so I think that's what the signal is here. But to your point, I mean, I think you need somebody with a lot of aerospace expertise. This is not a job where you bring in somebody from the auto industry or somebody from the healthcare industry who's a good operating CEO. You need somebody who knows aerospace, who understands airplane manufacturing um, and how to get this job done. How, why did this take so long, Brooke? Sorry? Why did this take so long to have the CEO step down at a time when this company was coming under spiraling allegations and a lot of questions around the culture? I mean, I think there was a reluctance to throw more chaos into the situation, which I can understand that there's a lot of scrutiny on Boeing right now and a lot that it needs to figure out. And a management change does, you know, add, add more variability to the process. So there was a little bit of that. But then I think it also goes back to what I was talking about. Of I don't think that this company until quite recently grappled how serious of a situation that it's in. Um, and even on the earnings call, it, their most recent one, they were sort of talking about this as a, as a temporary pause in, in production ramps for the 737. And I don't think that's the right attitude. The CFO was on the Jeffrey's earning, uh, conference call the other day and talking still about that $10 billion cash flow target that Boeing has out there. And they're not putting out annual targets, but they're still not backing off that $10 billion long-term target. And I don't think that's the right mentality now. And so I think, you know, we're finally seeing a moment where they're coming to terms with the, the seriousness of the situation that they're in. Will this ease any concerns the FAA has? I mean, I, I would think that the FAA had to have been apprised of, of what's happening here. And, you know, certainly they're going to be looking for somebody who will pay attention to all the manufacturing detail. I, I would think that, you know, Boeing would be in close talks with the regulator in, in terms of what the go forward plan looks like. Um, and you want to bring somebody in who has that aerospace manufacturing expertise. Um, so I don't think the FAA is going to be happy with you know, a, a surprise um, outsider with, with no expertise in this industry. Brooke, the investigations are ongoing. And I just wonder, and this is a difficult question to give a direct answer to, so forgive me for asking it, but I'm just thinking out loud. Remuneration for Dave Calhoun, how is this going to be managed 
as he heads to the exit, given these investigations will be ongoing and we've got no idea where they land? I, yes, I, I mean, I don't know the exact answer to that. It'll be interesting to see, you know, once we get the, the proxy filings and the terms of his retirement package to see what that looks like. Um, but I will say, I mean, I, you know, they didn't, Dennis Muhlenberg also stepped down and, and, and there's certainly a, a history here um, for, for how this gets managed without going executive. Brooke, appreciate your time this morning for reaction to this. Brooke Sutherland there of Bloomberg Opinion. Dave Calhoun announcing his intent to step down as CEO of Boeing. Boeing stock this morning higher by 2.3%. Up next on this program, U.S. automakers facing tough competition in China. What you've seen from China is three years ago, net import export on vehicles was zero. It was about zero. Last year, it was about five million net exports. So they've become a big player on the, on the global stage very quickly. Um, it's, really, it's really quite amazing. That conversation, up next. Stocks negative a third of 1% on the S&P 500, pulling back just a little bit. Update on the bond market. Treasury yields higher by three or four basis points. Under surveillance this morning, U.S. automakers facing tough competition in China. What you've seen from China is three years ago, net import-export on vehicles was zero. It was about zero. Last year, it was about five million net exports. So they've become a big player on the, on the global stage very quickly. Um, it's, really, it's really quite amazing. If you're, you're Xi and you're sitting there trying to drive your economy, you're pushing the auto industry. It's you know your yep. biggest employment base. It's your biggest you know um, sort of position of national pride, industrial manufacturing base. So they have a real um, position here uh, to drive forward the industry. Here's the latest this morning. U.S. automakers aiming to retain or regain footing in China as consumers in the world's biggest car market increasingly opt for domestic brands. GM in particular seeing a shift. Its U.S. sales outpacing China last year for the first time since 2009. Joining us now is Duncan Aldred, the global vice president of Buick and GMC at General Motors. Duncan, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. We have to begin in China. I want to talk about what's happening there, what's behind the slowdown. What's your read on what is developing there and the things picking up as we kick off 24? Well, China remains a really critical market in, in automotive. It's the biggest market in the world. It's about 50% bigger than the U.S. vehicle market. And General Motors have enjoyed great success over a long period of time. And Buick in particular has been General Motors' lead brand there. We're still delivering over half a million vehicle sales per year there. And it, and it really does remain a critical market for us. What does the consumer want? Do you see a shift to domestic brands? What are you up against? Clearly, the, the, the situation has changed. Domestic brands have become... Uh, a lot stronger, um, but Buick does remain strong there. And increasingly, people are, are moving towards hybrids, EVs, and, and increasing technology. How difficult is it, though, on the price war kind of front to really compete and also make a profit? Well, it's, it, the, the price sensitivity over there is, is great. Uh, and again, there's about 250 brands on sale in, in China. There's about 50 here. In, in the US. So you can imagine the competitive situation is, uh, is very difficult. However, Buick remains very, very strong. We've got the great lineup, the lineup that we sell here in the United States, increasingly introducing uh, EVs and PHEVs as well, hybrid electric vehicles. And again, we feel well placed to compete going forward. When you talk about here, I am wondering whether that's also been a challenge just because the electric vehicle demand hasn't been as great. There was a recent report in Cox Automotive that Buick inventory levels in particular so far this year have been a lot higher than other uh, types of cars, even within General Motors. Do you think that that's a reflection of the lack of appetite for electric vehicles in the U.S.? Well, we're not, we're not actually selling electric vehicles within the Buick brand in the U.S. yet. Um, what we're doing, we've launched two brand new vehicles last year. We're launching two brand new vehicles in the first half of this year. By the middle of this year, we'll have what we expect to be the freshest portfolio of any brand in the industry. And the customers are really responding to it. It's a new design language, a new logo, uh, and again, these totally fresh new products. Last year, we were the fastest growing mainstream brand in the industry, up 65%. This year, we've carried on that growth. We're up nearly 15% on a year-to-date basis. So really, people are responding to the new Buick uh, products and design language in, in great fashion. When you look at the China strategy, though, and to Lisa's point about this price war, I mean, BYD, once again, over this weekend, is cutting prices. 
If you're going to go after the luxury market, do you need to cut some of the lower end vehicles you're selling in China? Well, what we've got in China is, again, a really broad portfolio of vehicles, PHEVs uh, on the way, EVs already in the market, and of course, the traditional combustion engine vehicles. Where we've been particularly strong and leading the market uh, for Buick is in the, the people carrier space, so the minivan space. Now, this is a different minivan than we know here in, in the US. It's a very luxurious vehicle. The Buick GLA has led that segment and continues to be an absolute leader in that space. And again, there's a lot more to come in product development going forward. When you look at appetite for these bigger cars, is there more appetite in China for bigger cars? Because I know in the United States, that's why you came out with the Hummer EV, because there is this growing appetite to make sure you're even if you're going to be electric, you can have an SUV. Well, our electric strategy here uh, for GMC in the US started with, with Hummer, first of all, in truck format. Now we've introduced it in, in SUV format as well. Every month, the sales are better than the last month as our production continues to rise. And, and it really is an outstanding vehicle. We talk about potential slowdown, but the Hummer EV absolutely is ramping up. It's not slowing down. It is the world's first super truck. It is unique. It does go zero to 60 in three seconds. It does basically everything, everything you could want it to do. Now, coming on to China, we are about to embark on an export program to China with GMCs as well. Uh, more to come on that, but uh, in about the next 12 months or so, we'll be exporting GMCs as part of a global strategy there. We're already now selling in Korea, we're well established in the Middle East for, for nearly 100 years, and uh, we'll also be going to Australia. So GMC's strength continues to grow and grow. It really is a, an outstanding brand with outstanding success and the introduction of EVs is also going to help us begin this export program. Does it make life difficult when two of your biggest markets seem to have different consumer preferences? Is that tough? Well, clearly, you've, you've got to manage that. I mean, it's always been the case. How do you manage that? Can I jump in? Because I was speaking to Mary Barrett a few weeks ago, and we were talking about the prospect of GM leaning more into hybrids. And I was trying to work out how easy is it to toggle between pure EVs, ICE, hybrids. How quickly can you get a factory line to do that? Well, the beauty of somewhere like General Motors is we've got technologies on sale across the world. So clearly you, you leverage those technologies, whether it's, it's the combustion engine, whether it's the EV or indeed whether it's the, the hybrid or, or PHEV as well. So once you've got that technology developed, yeah, it's not it's not super easy to then transfer it into another product, but once the technology developed, which invariably it is within General Motors, that is something you can do. And that's why we've maintained a position saying we'll always respond to the market. And if the market is increasingly wanting hybrids of any description, then we'll, we'll pivot to that and we're well placed to do so. Do you see that where the market is right now currently? I think, it's going, to, I think it's going to be part of, of the, the development. We still maintain that an all EV future, we still maintain a zero emission strategy or vision is what we want to achieve. But I think hybrids will be part of that journey together. I'm always interested by the zero emissions climate push as well. When I hear about the electric, the EV Hummer, I've got to ask you this question. I ask it out loud all the time. How on earth is that good for the environment? I've seen the size of these things. They are massive. <laughs> How is that good for the environment? Well, How do we understand that? Well, they're nowhere near as big as you think, first of all. I, I think I was just saying, I actually bought one. It's not a company car, I bought one. It's the best vehicle ever you could buy. It's really easy to drive around town here, like somewhere in Manhattan. It's super easy. Four-wheel steer, make it turning circle the size of a small uh, car. The Creating roof. potholes because it's so heavy? No, no, no. Um, it's got air suspension so it glides along the potholes uh, of this great <laughs> city. Uh, the roof comes off making it a convertible vehicle. Zero to 60 in, in three seconds. It goes really anywhere off-road. It's got something called extract mode. And of course, if you're on the highway, it drives hands-free with super cruise technology. So this, this really is the world's first super truck. It's an outstanding vehicle. And again, zero tailpipe emissions. Okay, but to make the thing to make the thing? Well, that's what I'm getting at here. Zero tailpipe emissions, I understand that, but to make an electric Hummer, an EV, are we saying that's good for the environment? Well, clearly we're very responsible in the sourcing of materials that go yep. into the batteries that then create the, the Ultium battery and technologies that, that go into them. So we're, we're very responsible, not only on the tailpipe, but on the holistic nature of, of that battery development as well. I've seen them, they're big. Duncan, thank you, sir. <laughs> Appreciate it. Duncan Aldred, I'm not sure how that works around Manhattan, but that was quite a pitch. Well, I'm just wondering how you get a parking spot. I mean, just the practical kind of consideration and if people double park, you know, then it's a problem for the buses getting through. That's been an issue recently. What, driving your Hummer around <laughs> Manhattan? <laughs> yeah, that's been my ample experience driving my Hummer, blocking the buses.
Duncan Aldrett, the Global VP of Buick and GMC. Thank you, sir. It's Thank good you. to see you. Coming up next, Neil Dutta of Renmac from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Stocks softer here by a third of 1% on the S&P. Bramo converted. Electric <laughs> Hummer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Around gonna... Manhattan. Oh, yeah. I found a couple of parking spots. Nowhere. You know when they dig up the roads? You know when they're digging up the <laughs> oh, roads? Yeah, yeah. Sixth Avenue right now. Third Avenue. Part of park. I mean, seriously, oh, yeah. just like on and on and on they and on. Sh they should just have a sign outside of Manhattan saying construction. <laughs> under construction. <laughs> Constant. <laughs> Perpetual under construction. Constant. That's what it feels like. Then the roads are smooth for like five minutes. And you're all gonna write in and say, it's the weather. Yes, I understand. Okay, <laughs> equities on the S&P, down a third of 1%. It doesn't mean it's good, does it? <laughs> the NASDAQ, I'm just arguing with myself, okay. down a half of 1%. <laughs> it's that kind of morning, huh? That sort of pro New York vibe, you know. I'm pro New York, but oh. when it comes to any complaint about it, it's just sort of like, yeah, but we have to do this because okay. of the weather. I'm a native New Yorker, and I will just say, Self-deprecation is part of it. We all know that there should just be a big sign that says bump before Manhattan, that there should be a big sign that says potholes beware. We're fully aware. It's okay. Sure. Also, John, you could just go underground and then you won't feel it. True, yeah. That's oh, a good point. Really? That's a good well, point. That one. Let's get to the bond market. <laughs> Two year, 10 year, 30 year. Yields look like this this morning. Drifting higher up by three basis points. 422.76 up two basis points on a two year. 461.26. I'm just saying, given how much we pay in taxes, you'd think that the roads were smoother. That's all I'm saying. You'd think that there wouldn't right. be signal malfunctions on the subway. Precisely. Exactly. All Lots of that of stuff. Things. All of the above. Mm. Let's finish on foreign exchange. <laughs> You sort of interject with commentary about the city as we go along. <laughs> the Euro, 108.32. Under surveillance this morning, just finding out moments ago, this hour, Boeing announcing a series of leadership changes. President and CEO Dave Calhoun is set to step down at the end of this year. Stan Deal, the commercial airplanes president and CEO, is retiring effective today. The company saying Calhoun's move will stabilise the plane maker. The changes come after a series of mishaps and investigations, including a mid-air blowout aboard an Alaska Airlines flight earlier this year. The fact the stock is up, I think, speaks volumes, Lisa. We're up by almost 3%. You know, what Brooke Sutherland said was really telling, that they didn't understand the scope of how serious this was at the outset. Maybe this is the beginning of the recognition. This is massive for them, and they need a sea change culturally as well as just with respect to their safety protocol. These are the cultural issues that Brooke was talking about. Absolutely. The issue you hear time and time again when it comes to Boeing is that issues that are happening on the factory floor are not getting to the C-suite. And look at what you mentioned earlier, these documents that Congress was after. They actually cannot find these documents attached to potentially some of these issues they are trying to remedy. What's interesting, though, is he's stepping down the end of the year. So that says to me that they don't have a successor ready to go. This is going to take a few months. Do you believe that they can't find those documents? And not for me to say whether I believe or not. I'm I just, think, I'm uh, just what saying. I will say, though, the fact they can't speaks to the way this company's been managed over the years. That was diplomatic. Doesn't speak to it in a good way, right? Well, this is part of the problem. I mean, we don't even understand the scope of the problem, and there's not been any good news. I mean, really, has there been any sort of ray of sunshine that they've overhauled anything or they found something no, positive? No, every time we've covered this company, it's been more bad news. Every single time. Maybe this is a tipping point. The stock is up by something like 3%. And maybe for investors, what we heard in the last 30 minutes wasn't bad news. Maybe that was the first piece of good news. Apple, Google, Meta in the antitrust hot seat this morning. On the other side of the Atlantic, EU regulators announcing a full-blown investigation into whether the tech giants are complying with the Digital Markets Act. Apple and Google, in particular, under fire for allegedly monopolizing browser and search engine usage. Meta's subscription fees also in the crosshairs. The companies facing potentially hefty fines of up to 10% of global revenue are up to 20% in the case of repeated breaches. Now, your response to this, Lisa, the same as mine initially this morning, which was like, here we go again in Europe. Then you speak to the experts. So Mandeep Singh, Bloomberg Intelligence, Alex Webb out of Bloomberg in London, both saying that maybe what we're hearing this morning, at least in the immediate term, could be bigger than what we heard last week from the DOJ. That's exactly what I was going to say. I was wrong. I absolutely had the wrong interpretation of the story when it came out, which was yet another suit. To me, there is a bigger question of how much is this the utilitization of big tech, 
of the behemoths that control so much of the infrastructure that people use to communicate, how much is this regulators on both sides of the Atlantic saying, we want to have more control, and that's going to limit your profitability longer term? Mandeep also made the point that this could be imminent. They could be fa facing these fees imminently, while when it comes to the DOJ, this is going to take months or years. While when it comes to Europe, they're going to be cracking down immediately and potentially getting up to 10% of global revenue in terms of fines. Yeah, and just to pick up on what Lisa said a few times already in the last few hours, it's not just the fines, it's the potential behavioural changes as well that could be pushed through and pretty soon. Bear in mind, we were looking for a new phone in September and maybe a partnership with Google's Gemini and Mandeep Singh throwing a bit of cold water over that earlier on today. Hard to see how they could have data sharing if people are worried about the dominance of both companies. So what next for their phone? Can they compete really with Samsung, given the fact that they are, by all intents and purposes and by all reports, behind on the AI front? That's the latest on big tech. Let's push forward a little bit. More Fed speak on deck through today. Kicking off with Goolsby, Bostick and Cook. Wallace speaks on Wednesday, head of Daily and Powell speaking on Friday. Markets kicking off a shortened week, set to end with personal income and spending data, plus the Fed's preferred inflation read, core PCE. That's going to come on Friday, Lisa, when the market is closed and hopefully no one comes in to this room at the end of this show and says special program Friday morning. You think that there's no, no, really, <laughs> why would you even do that? Ideas. It's not I mean, that important. On, really? Everyone will be away and okay. they'll pick public up and talk about it Monday. No, public service announcement. We already know what it is because Jay Powell leaked it. So we already know go. it's 0.3% for the headline. And so we can just carry on. The dear management, we don't need a show because he told us the number already. Why would you? Yeah? Why would you? Good. Why would you even bring it up? Giving people ideas. Don't worry, there won't be a show. Stocks pausing on the back of another record week. We love doing shows for you. Fueled by the Fed's latest confirmation, we really do. It will cut sometime this year. With the market on track for its fifth consecutive month of gains. I'm speaking to management, not the audience. Neil Dutter <laughs> of Ranmac, we love doing it for you too. Here's the quote. Neil, the markets rightly viewed the Fed decision as dovish, hence the rally in stocks and bonds. The risk is that January and February's inflation data represent a series of higher than expected inflation prints. Ultimately, power sees the stance of monetary policy is very restrictive. As a result, he's more on alert for downside surprises to growth than he is upside surprises to inflation. Neil, I'm pleased to say, joins us now for more. So Neil, let's get into your framework. I remember a line of yours at the end of last year. I remember you sent me a message and you said the labour market is no longer a reason to be hawkish. And I thought it was really important at the time because it wasn't just that the labour market was somehow weakening or deteriorating. It was that even with labour market strength, even with economic growth, that was no longer a reason per se to be hawkish. Neil, can you just walk us through how you're thinking about the economy with that in mind? Yeah, sure. Thanks, John, for having me on. Well, you know, compensation growth equals inflation plus productivity. OK, and uh, we know that compensation growth is moderating. You know, there's a lot of focus, of course, on wages uh, because that's the monthly data. But, you know, remember that benefits are slowing a lot more rapidly than uh, wages and salaries. And in theory, workers bargain over their entire compensation package. And when you look at quits, quits are basically below where they were just before the pandemic. And it suggests that uh, broad measures of compensation growth, like the employment cost index, will be you know, somewhere in the vicinity of 3% by the end of the first quarter. Now, if you have 3% compensation growth, and we know that productivity is normalizing to around 1.5%, where is the inflation coming from? So if compensation is 3, maybe 3.5, three and, and productivity is around 1.5, then you're at the Fed's underlying inflation objective of 2. So there's a lot of focus right now on things like goods prices, producer prices, you know, as I mentioned last time I was on the program, Lisa's very focused on chocolate prices. Very. But, <laughs> but there's, there's limited pass through from those things into core consumer prices. And um, I do think that the, the normalization of labor market conditions will take a lot of the pressure off of services, which are running, you know, well above what they normally run above with respect to goods prices. Now, one take that we heard last week repeatedly, I think across the street, including from yourself, was that the Fed was embracing the supply side narrative. Could you briefly describe that a little bit more broadly and help me understand how do you set monetary policy when it's the supply side doing all the work? Well, I mean, I think first it's important to understand why um, the supply side looks better. I think that's primarily a function of normalization dynamics uh, following the pandemic. So, you know, this time last year, labor productivity growth was deeply negative, and now it's normalizing. Uh, that that's that essentially raises the speed limit for the economy. So, if you have 
uh, stronger economic growth, as Powell mentioned, I mean, you could have stronger employment and economic growth without necessarily pushing inflation higher. Uh, and I think that's why it's important. It gives the Fed room uh, to kind of uh, recalibrate policy. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that, and that's why it's important. Um, you know, so productivity's up. Um, that gives the Fed a little bit more uh, more space to to, to ease, uh, you know, modestly if inflation's slowing more quickly. Neil, I'm having a hard time, and I'm having a hard time for a number of reasons. Partly because it's very hard to find people who can really pose some sort of negative case. But there is one to be made with the data that is coming in hotter than expected in certain areas. You talk about the fact that it, wage inflation seems to be nowhere. The New York Fed has a new measure of trend wage inflation that Torsten Slock put out this morning, saying that it's currently running at 5 percent and looking pretty sticky. Other measures showing that inflation is reaccelerating, uh, with Jim Bianco saying this no landing is going to pose a real problem for bond markets. How do you dismiss those things out of turn and retain faith in the disinflation story? Well, you have to go to first principles. I mean, I, I'm not a big believer in indicator macro. I don't like going and saying, look at this indicator. See, you know, it's up. Well, I mean, that's again, as I mentioned before, I mean, looking at the wage number, that's one thing. But people bargain over their entire compensation. Right. I mean, that's just a, to me, that's a red herring to distract people from the best measure of compensation growth, which is the employment cost index. OK. Um, and, uh, you know, there's minimal pass through from from goods into uh, into 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 core consumer prices. But as I mentioned, first principles, where is the acceleration in household and corporate measures of inflation expectations? Where is this showing up in earnings calls? Where? I mean, Costco is talking about uh, basically holding the line on prices. Walmart's talking about bringing their rollback back. So, I mean, if, if, if households expect inflation to basically be, uh, you know, I mean, the, those expectations have been coming down in the last few months, uh, it would suggest that, um, you know, the inflation upside surprises that we've seen in the realized data will be fleeting. Well, but uh, I'd, also point out, I'd also point out, Lisa, that inflation data has been generally on the weaker side of the consensus overseas. Interesting. Um, it would support the idea that I think the Fed is putting a lot of currency into, I think rightly, that um, that residual seasonality is a big driver of why the inflation numbers looked a little bit worse in January and February. Then, Neil, if that's the case, do you reject this idea of a reacceleration of the economy in some sort of material way and a broadening out around the world and say that that's premature because there is more weakness under the hood and, frankly, challenges to certain businesses that don't have the pricing power that would suggest that the Fed was justified in cutting now? I think, to me, the strength of the economy, that's a reason to expect a ceiling on how many cuts the Fed can deliver. It's not a reason for the Fed not to cut, cut at all. I think, I think part of this is we're, we're all very used to the Fed cutting a lot or not at all, because primarily it's, you know, they're, they're cutting aggressively to stop a recession from gaining hold or they're, you know, they're already too late and that's why you're in a recession, you have to cut a lot. What I'm talking about is just a recalibration of policy. It's difficult to see the Fed cutting six, seven times because, as you mentioned, the economy is strong. But if inflation is falling, they can at least adjust policy a little bit to kind of reset the economy. There, this isn't a outright easing. It's just simply taking policy from significantly restrictive to maybe a little bit less restrictive. That's all. I mean, this isn't like a broad wholesale change. I think that's kind of um, the sort of... Uh, thing that people are getting, I think, in my view, confused by. This isn't a wholesale change of policy. It's simply a recalibration of, of monetary conditions. Neil, I'd like to finish there because I think those words are really important. Just how bullish the reaction function of the Federal Reserve actually is, because many people ran away with the idea that it was super, super bullish. Neil, I just wonder how close we actually were to having a very different conversation. If that median dot had shifted from three cuts to two, and it was very close to doing so, do you think the conversation would have been very different after the Fed meeting Wednesday? Not really, because what would have happened? My sense is that the bond market, I mean, the markets probably would have sold off a little bit. Um, I mean, certainly the expectation going into that meeting, John, was that, you know, we were kind of gravitating. The risk was for, for two cuts instead of three. Um, and maybe if they penciled in two, the markets would have taken that and, um, and sold off a little bit. You would have seen a modest tightening of financial conditions. But then guess what? Chair Powell would have come out, struck the same dovish tone, and then markets would have rallied. So I, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think I think the big story is 
they're cutting. They're just not cutting as aggressively. I mean, the strong growth in the economy puts a floor or sorry, a ceiling under how many cuts they can do. And that's also in the dots. That's in the that's in the outlook for 25 and 26. Got it. Neil, great to catch up. Got to do it again soon. Neil Dutta there of Renmac on the latest in the economy and on the Federal Reserve as well, Bramag. Basically just aggressively bullish. I mean, but in a good way, right? I mean, he's gotten it right. At the same time, this is really the debate. Is there more disinflation than people realize? And if so, is the Fed cutting just a touch to be neutral? This is really the key debate and people don't want to take them at their word. We'll get another piece of data on Friday morning. Equities right now on the S&P, negative by a third of 1%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with the Hira Hackers. Hey, Hira. Hi, John. Former President Donald Trump faces a deadline today to post a bond to cover a roughly half billion dollar civil fraud judgment against him. Otherwise, New York State can start the process of seizing some of his assets, including real estate in Manhattan. Trump will also be in court today after being accused of falsifying business records to disguise hush money payments before the 2016 election. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is set to visit China next month for meetings with senior leaders, according to reporting from Politico. The trip follows Yellen's meetings in Beijing last July, which resulted in the formation of a working group with China, promising, quote, frank and substantive discussions on matters involving economic and financial policy. Goldman Sachs says the S&P could hit 6,000 this year. Strategists led by David Costin are sticking with their year-end target of 5,200, but have a scenario in which tech mega caps could lead the index up another 15%. The S&P is up almost 10% this year and closed Friday above 5,230. That's already left many strategists' year-end forecasts in the dust. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Up next on the program, Boeing CEO stepping down. We caused the problem, and we understand that. We instituted additional quality controls and inspections at Boeing and at our supplier. That conversation, up next. Stocks on the S&P 500 down by about a quarter of 1% on the S&P, slightly softer, negative, 42 minutes away from the opening bell. Yields are a little bit higher throughout much of this morning. We're up a couple of basis points on a 10-year, 421.98. Quite a quiet start so far to the week ahead. Picks up as the week progresses. Under surveillance this morning, Boeing CEO stepping down. We caused the problem, and we understand that. We instituted additional quality controls and inspections at Boeing and at our supplier. We issued bulletins to suppliers to strengthen the focus on conformance and reducing the risks of quality escapes. It's the latest this morning. Boeing announcing CEO Dave Calhoun will step down at the end of the year after a string of mishaps and investigations at the plane maker. In a letter to employees, Calhoun saying, quote, the eyes of the world are on us, and I know that we will come through this company, this moment, a better company. Joining us now is George Ferguson of Bloomberg Intelligence. George, let's get straight into this one. The names will change. How is the leadership going to change? Well, I mean, I think they need to uh, go out and get themselves, a, you know, Boeing needs to get themselves a very good CEO that's uh, from a manufacturing and an engineering base and not so much a financial base. And so it remains to be seen who they go out and find. But that, I think that's the next big uh, order for Boeing. George, this felt like it was on the table from the very beginning, but not for the company. It's something that Brooke Sutherland alluded to, that perhaps they didn't realize how big this might turn out to be. When do you think the defining moment for them actually was in the last few months? When did they realize that maybe they need some big changes? I mean, I mean, the, to me, the defining moment was just all the, actually, I think it was more a death of a thousand cuts, right? It was just all the little problems that were coming through the manufacturing process, especially at a Spirit Aero Systems of just airplanes that just weren't completed correctly. And so I don't think it was any big event, but just the constancy of the problems coming out that were, uh, were the beginning of the end for this. George, as they search for another chief executive officer, how much of a liability is it that there isn't a robust, multi-pronged industry here with many players, that there really is just a duopoly, one in Europe and one in the U.S.? No, I think it's definitely a challenge because of that. There's, I don't think there's a, a wide talent base here. But, but 
I think the suppliers also are probably, uh, you know, a fertile ground potentially for for another CEO. You know, I think especially as you get into some of the engine manufacturers, there may be uh, there may be some talent down there they can go find. That that business is a super tight tolerance business, heavy engineering business. I think that's what they need for the next CEO. So I think you'll see it broader. You'll see it inside the supply chain as well, and maybe even outside. But I think it has to come from a really strong manufacturing, uh, you know, someone with a really strong manufacturing background and engineering background. What do you think this means for how quickly they can reach a deal with Spirit Arrow, how quickly they can incorporate the trouble child, really, that they've blamed for a lot of the problems? Yeah, so um, it's interesting, right, because I think they said Calhoun's going to finish out the year, which to me seems like a long period of time to do this transition, because I feel like they, they really need to build confidence now and they really need to get on the road to fixing the company now. And so I would hope this doesn't mean Spirit Air Systems is pushed off until uh, next year sometime. I think that's already well underway and I would think it would continue and they would try to get that closed as soon as possible because I think the road to success goes through that acquisition, the road to successfully stabilizing uh, and improving quality for the 737 goes through Spirit. And so I think they can't wait on it. George, what do you make of the fact that the board has been doing a listening tour, a meeting with airline executives, but without Calhoun there? Well, I mean, to me, when I heard that, that was, you know, I, I thought that was a clear sign. Well, one, their most important customers were very concerned and wanted to meet with the board. Uh, and without Calhoun there, to me, that was a clear sign that they, they were probably pushing uh, to get a change to the top of Boeing. Again, they, they need a confidence builder, they need an operator, uh, and I think the airline CEO saw that and, and uh, brought that to the board. Given the fact that you think this person needs to be an engineer mind, do you think this is ripe for potentially a split in this job? Someone who's definitely focused on the financials and someone else who's focused on the engineering and the safety of these planes? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch this. Say that again. Well, do you think this could be a moment where you see almost a split at the top for how Boeing is run? Someone who's an engineer mind versus someone who's more financially focused? Well, so, I mean, you know, every organization has sort of their top engineering officer, their top safety officer, and Boeing's no different. So they've already got that inside the structure. I, you know, I, I don't see a split so much. I think that the CEO... Of, of Boeing new, you know, whatever the new CEO is going to be, they need to be someone that's really had a really strong amount of experience, again, sort of in quality manufacturing and, and with, with good engineering at the core of the business that they ran. So I don't, I, I still think it needs to be inculcated all the way at the top and you can't necessarily split those, those job roles up. You need someone that thinks that way, I think. Hey, George, appreciate the update. Big change. George Ferguson there of Bloomberg. That stock is up by close to 4%. We talked about that defining moment. AMH, I think you've alluded to it. That meeting, no CEO. No CEO. The board is on a listening tour. They're meeting with all these airline executives. We talked about it last week. And notably missing was going to be CEO Calhoun. And I think a lot of people thought, well, if he's not going to be there, are they just these airline chiefs going to be complaining about him and how he's running Boeing. I just also wonder about the talent pool of people who are actually in the industry who can come from outside, who will have fresh eyes. If you don't have a real competitor, how do you get that talent? And, and that, it's a real issue. It's, uh, with the pool's sort of, in two companies. Exactly. And this is sort of, you know, one of the challenges in having the fresh ideas and the gut check that comes with a robust competitive environment. Maybe Bruno Le Maire? has an idea of someone from Airbus they can send over to Boeing. Yeah, I'm not sure they want to lose anyone, do they? Not at this point. Coming up tomorrow, the coverage continues. Max Kentner of HSBC, Pooja Sriram of Barclays, Julian Emanuel of Evercore ISI and Cities Andrew Hollenhorst. I have to say, looking forward to the conversation with all four of them. But Max Kentner of HSBC, very interesting year. So Max starts the year, comes out, he's been bullish the whole of 2023, starts 2024, says reverse Goldilocks. The economy is going to be too strong. The Fed's going to have to back away from all these cuts. It's going to be negative for risk. Now, I would say he got like 75% of the story right. The problem was he got the market piece wrong. We'll talk about that tomorrow. And he basically is backtracking on it and seeing how this could be, uh, you know, something that continues. It's the wall of money. How many people have we heard that from? There is a wall of money and it keeps going into asset classes for far beyond any kind of rational rally, which will lead to exuberance, but not for a couple of years. So keep eye. Constructive on the equity market and constructive on pretty much everything else, right? I mean, it's everything, really. HSBC. The wall of money. <laughs> From New York, what was that? <laughs>
<laughs> it's just like, you know, firepower oh. into the market. So I'm not going to do that again. Welcome back to another Miami Open update from Bloomberg TV and Radio from Tennis Channel. The reigning U.S. Open champion Coco Gauff cruised into the round of 16 with a dominant display against Ocean Dodan. From 4-2 down in the opening set, the American went on a tear, taking the last 10 games of the match to close out the comfortable victory, 6-love in the second. And don't forget, Tennis Channel's live daily coverage starts at 11 a.m. Eastern.